get us all off camera? Okay. okay, good morning. <laughs> we'll uh, call to order the January 18, 2022 meeting of the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners. At this time, it's my pleasure to invite the Reverend Graham Bingham from Westminster Pres Presbyterian Church up to the podium. He'll be providing the, the invocation. That will be followed by a Pledge of Allegiance led by County Attorney Dylan Rheingold. And we will begin with a moment of silent reflection for our first responders, who we have quite a good crowd of those folks here today, so please um, keep them in your thoughts and prayers, and also members of the Armed Forces. Would everyone please rise? Eternal God, we thank you for this new day and the gift of life you have granted to each of us as the employees and citizens of Indian River County. We pray for your blessing on each of our county commissioners and their supporting staff and all our first responders and those who stand between us and the enemies of our country. And we ask that you'll bless them all with grace, strength, and wisdom. Bless our commissioners as they make their decisions and conduct their work on behalf of Indian River County. Lord, may their deliberations and actions be that which will be a blessing to the citizens of Indian River County for we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing, face the flag, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend. Hmm. So, Commissioners, you know that I'm usually the first one to push for the uh, summer dress code every year. Um, but, Commissioner Adams, I think you're taking things a little to the extreme here. Would you like to care to explain your outfit this morning? Well, this, it's, it's cold, so I was just wearing ah. a jaunty winter cap that also um, evokes the festive nature of the Frog Lake Festival that starts on Thursday. So... It's frog like time, everybody. All righty, here it is. Hot off the press from Commissioner <laughs> Adams. <laughs> uh, all righty, here we go. Um, commissioners, there was an addition to the agenda. It's on your agenda now, it's item 4A. This is from the IT department, a multi factor authentication software. I'd like to go ahead and move that to 12E. Um, the request was consent, but I think since it is a, um, a, a dollar amount involved, that for full transparency, it'd be better to have it as a separate agenda item. So move that item to 12E. And I'd like to move my item, 14A1, uh, to follow uh, 5C and 5D, the seagrass and muck presentations. And commissioners, are there any other additions or deletions to the agenda? Mr. Chair, yes. I, just, I just have one concern. I, I've already spoken to the uh, county attorney about this, and this is on the uh, proclamation regarding uh, certified registered nurse anesthesia uh, week. And um, the concern I have is with the fourth uh, whereas, uh, and I'll, I'll state that um, CRNAs are qualified to make independent judgments regarding all aspects of anesthesia care based on their education, training, and licensure. And uh, my concern is that I don't want to appear to be um, contradicting state law. Uh, there are some states that allow uh, nurse anesthetists to operate independently of physicians. Florida is not one of those states. 
So I don't want to um, be misinforming the community in any way. While we love our nurses and we thank them uh, with all our hearts because they've been on the front line in the battle against COVID for years, so we certainly appreciate them. But I was advised by the county attorney that this would be the appropriate time to express my concern with regard to uh, that fourth whereas on that proclamation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your concern. I think when we do the proclamation, we do have two people here uh, accepting that proclamation, and maybe they could clarify uh, your concerns for you. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner, is there anything else? Mr. Chair, move approval as amended. Second. We have a motion from Joe, second by Joe. <laughs> All in favor, signify with aye. Aye. <laughs> aye. Any opposed? That carries 5 0. And that was Commissioner Flesher on the motion and Commissioner Ehrman on the second. Our first proclamation is a presentation honoring Chief, I'm gonna just say Ron uh, Angelone on his retirement from Indian River County Board of County Commissioners, Department of Emergency Services. And I'm going to ask uh, Vice Chairman Commissioner Ehrman to make this presentation. And Ron, come on up to the podium, please. Morning, Ron. Well, Ron, it, it, it gives me great pleasure and honor to, to read your proclamation, but first, it wouldn't be the same without talking about Renario Luginio Angeloni. <laughs> okay, good attempt. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best I could do. I probably should have let the fly. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. He, he would know it better. I know, but you're the fire guy. Okay, no, I'm talking about his name being oh, the translation. Jersey thing. Yeah. yeah, that's the first thing I want to start out of. But there's a lot of people in this room that can tell some stories, but some are new. I see some new faces that, that don't know. Uh, you know, when when uh, Chief Angeloni was was hired as a, as a as a new fireman back in I believe it was 1988, I think. And uh, when he walked through the door, everybody looked like we just hired a guy from New Jersey. Because <laughs> everybody here was local at the time, back in the back in the eighties, you know, everybody here was local or at least from Florida. We had, we didn't have anybody from from out of out of county much or much less out of state, especially from a place like New Jersey. And we were like, Okay, this'll be this'll be interesting. See 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 he was got you know, we were all a little bit skeptical, but but right away when you when you met Ron you knew he was just a he was a nice guy and a great guy and and uh, one thing you could tell about Ron right away that he had the desire to learn and and be a be a good fireman, and that's one thing that that for all for all you new guys out there, that's one thing we can't teach you in the fire service is we can't teach you the desire. We can teach you how to do everything else: climb a ladder, pull a hose, do friction loss, whatever the whatever the case may be. But one thing we can instill in teaching you is that desire, and Ron had that that desire uh, right away. And you could tell that, that Ron was also a guy that wanted to. To, to make something of himself and wanted to add to the department. He, he cared about the department the day he was hired and he cares about the department still to this very day. Probably more than anybody I know. Uh, he always had that, that, that desire to, to make it a better place and help each and every one of us and help each and every one of you. You know, Ron was a guy that was, was driven uh, to succeed, but he did it in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very passionate and unselfish way to succeed. Um, that's what was unique about him. You didn't want to test against Ron. I'm glad I was already a lieutenant when he got hired. But I didn't want to test against him because this guy would, would, you didn't bother him like at 8 o'clock at night. He was back in his room studying for the promotional test and studying, studying. But one thing that was unique about Ron is he may be taking the time to study, but if you asked him to help you study, he would take the time to help you study also. Whether he was competing with you for a spot or whether you maybe <laughs> say you were going for an engineer spot and he was testing for captain or something like that, he would still help you do that. So that was one thing that, that you just can't, you can't buy in a person, especially in the fire service, to be that unselfish to take the time to do it. So Ron rose through the, through the ranks very quickly, as, as we all know, and, and uh, he was, he was a, he, of course, engineer, lieutenant, and then he became captain. And, and that's when, that's when we started getting real close because I would be his relief every morning. And I can just remember coming in every morning, Ron sitting at the desk going, <laughs> I, I, I just don't know what to do. A 
I said, what's wrong, Ron? He said, we got 10 overtimes this morning. <laughs> I, I think I failed them all. But I started at 6 o'clock this morning. I think I'm done. I said, he said, I'm just worn out. I got, I got, I got to go home. So but we had many talks about that, and you know, I'm sure that hasn't changed much. But, but we, had, uh, we had many talks, and we had a lot of good times and, and a lot of good things. And Ron and I went on a lot of good calls together, even though we weren't always on the same shift. You know, we were working overtime or something like that, and we would get to see each other and talk to each other. But, but there was uh, no more dedicated person than Ron. Ron was, a, was a, a, a lieutenant at Station 3 for many years, and he learned the airport back and forth. And if you want to know anything about the Brewer Beach Conditional Airport, and you can't talk to Todd Shear at the airport, talk to Ron. He can tell you everything about the airport that you need to know and about crash, fire, and rescue training. Also, what a couple of things that, that people may not know about Ron, some of it's reflected in the, in the, in the uh, proclamation that I'll read, but Ron is a, is, a, is a huge, is a really good artist, if you don't know that. Ron can draw like nobody's business. And uh, well, I wish we could have seen more of that over the years on different things, but, but, but Ron is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a complete artist and draw characters, anything like that. It was just awesome. Ron was also a great cook. He didn't know much about grits or scrambled eggs or, or uh, things like that being from New Jersey, but if you wanted a good Italian meal, Ron was the guy to go to to get one. But God help you if you were the crew with him because you were cleaning up the kitchen for the next <laughs> half hour or so after it got done because every dish in the station would be used. And uh, I think Stevie Graw, we were talking about this yesterday, said, Ron's, what the way Ron would do ingredients in his pasta and stuff like that, like the cheese, it would just be throwing it in. He, he knew he wouldn't want it. He knew how to measure it, but he had, a, he had a style to do that. And the kitchen would pretty much be a wreck after he was done with it. And so uh, that was the, uh, that was one of the, the highlights of Ron cooking, but you knew that you were going to be stuck with, with every, everybody on duty cleaning the kitchen for the next half hour or so after, after, after dinner was over. But it, but it was, it was awesome. Ron was also devoted to his community. I don't know, Ron, how many years did you do fair ticket sales for the, for the fair? I lost count. 20, 20 years? It's been a while. So Ron was dedicated to the, to the firefighters fair too. Ron handled all the outside ticket sales, all the advanced ticket sales and stuff like that, which is, which is a monumental job. On top of everything else he did, Ron's also an accomplished author with the fire service between the National Fire Academy and the, and the IFSTA, which is the, the Bible that we train all our, all our firefighters by. So. I mean, pretty impressive. Plus, a good father. His son's here. His son's a newly hired fireman with the county, which which is awesome. And uh, it, it, the list goes on and on. But you couldn't you couldn't ask for a, a better fellow firefighter, a better person to be in the fire service to help you. And, and it's and it's no doubt that, that that Ron leaving today has left any River County Fire Rescue better than he found it. Oh, yeah. So that's awesome. With that, Ron, I'm going to read your proclamation. Proclamation honoring Bureau, Bureau Chief Renario Lugino Angeloni on his retirement from any River County Fire Department of Emergency Services. Whereas Renario Ron Angeloni began his distinguished fire rescue career in serving the citizens of any River County in November of 1985 as a member of the then Vero Lakes Estates Volunteer Fire Department and later hired as a professional firefighter by South Indian River County Fire Rescue on March 4th, 1988. And whereas, as the creation of the emergency service districts and the evolution of the fire rescue division grew to meet the demands of the county, so did Ron by taking a leadership role in raising the standards of excellence for all others to follow at each level of service as he rose steadily through the ranks. And whereas, embracing the value of education, Ron became licensed and certified in many specialized areas of firefighting and paramedicine. Among his many accomplishments and accolades, most noteworthy is the distinction of being the 22nd person of the rank of lieutenant to graduate from the U.S. Fire Administration's National Fire Academy as an executive fire officer and is professionally recognized as such. And whereas Ron is an accomplished author of published research documents through the U.S. Fire Administration and was recruited 
by International Fire Service Training Association, which is the IFSTA, to assist in writing fire service training manuals. His dedication and diverse perspectives had contributed to the enhancement and overall expertise of the Indian River County Emergency Services Administration and fire services as a whole. And whereas Ron, an officer, an educator, mentor, is respected by his peers and subordinates for strong and competent leadership, instruction and guidance that encourages safety, professionalism, and efficiency in rendering higher level of service to the community, and for his compassion of assisting others in their personal and professional development, while quietly providing counseling to those in need. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners that after 36 years of dedicated service to the citizens of Indian River County and the fire rescue profession, retired on December 30th, 2021, Renario Angeloni, Bureau Chief of the Emergency Services Department, leaves an enduring legacy that is etched in the hearts and minds of all he encountered and that the board on behalf of the county wishes to express our deepest gratitude. Adopted this 18th day of January, 2022 by the Board of County Commissioners and signed by all five of us. So, Ron, thanks. Ron, would you like to say a few words? Oh, me? <laughs> yeah, as if we could stop you, right? <laughs> Joe, thank you for um, all you said, um, kind words and well wishes and all. It's definitely been an adventure, I'll say that. Um, it's one I'm going to sorely miss, of course, but uh, it's been an adventure filled with challenges, laughter, tears, but you know, something I would never uh, trade for anything. You know, I'm so proud to have had the opportunity to serve the county, uh, to work with such wonderful people, work with you, and my life is much richer because of it. I really, other than thank you, I'd just like to address the guys, if you, if you don't mind. Sure. Just hear me. Remember, the fire service has been here long before any of us and will continue long after we're all gone. But it's what you do while you're here that matters. Be that difference. Leave your mark, leave your legacy, and leave it in a better place than when you found it. And if you remember anything that I've ever taught you guys or said to you guys, be safe. That's it. Thanks, Thanks Thank Ryan. I just want to thank you for the opportunity for you existing. And when you said do when we're here and you turn to the troops, you did do that. For the viewing public, there's, there's at least 30 firefighters here, fire medics here, that you've trained personally. Is there anybody here that has not been trained by Ron? I didn't think so. You've left your legacy, you've made your mark, and it'll continue on. I think we're in great shape because of one Ron Angeloni. Thank you so much for everything that you have done for the citizens of Indian River County and will continue to do through all these individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Jason. Uh, thank you, Ron. I mean, that my, my thing about that, that, I, that I've seen with Ron is I can't think of anybody more dedicated to the profession and more dedicated to doing the, the job and sharing that knowledge. We saw today, you know, as in his farewell, he's, he's still teaching, right? Um, and, and, and I just always saw Ron as, as the guy who would 
jump in and do whatever needed to be done, whatever that was, would go and get it done. And then ju just that commitment, level of commitment and, and passion um, in doing the best that he can for the organization and for the citizens of Indian River County. So I just really appreciate that. Um, and just, just being a great guy, getting to, the chance to, uh, to, to work with you over the years. So thank you, Ron. Thank you. Ron, come on up and we'll get a picture and give you a proclamation. You want to bring a few of your friends up? Need uh, three rows up front here and right in the middle. Size order by alphabet. Uh, Ron, this is where you have to show your leadership, man. <laughs> <laughs> Was this part of the training? Did we able to train them to get together and no, form no, up? It's not my job anymore. Oh. <laughs> Uh, we want the blue shirts down here too. Ron, thank, thank you. you Ron, Congratulations. We're going to have to make at least two rows. The shorter guy is coming up front. Yeah. Height challenge people like this. Anybody but Ron is standing in front of me. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Moss and I are on tippy toes. <laughs> Can we get everybody? All right. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. Close. And, you know, I heard the story about the cooking yesterday, and he was pretty generous in only half an hour to clean up. I'm out here like half a shift to clean up. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way it's been. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Next, we have a proclamation designating January 23rd through the 29th, 2022 as Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist Week. And we have our very own Nicole Matson here. Come on up, Nicole. And Jacques Goulet, I believe is, okay, great. Welcome, we'll, um, Commissioner Adams is gonna read the proclamation. And if you'd like to say a few words, that'd be great. Thank you. It's my pleasure to read a proclamation designating January 23rd through 29th, 2022, a certified registered nurse anesthetist. How do you say that? Anesthetist. Anesthetist. Thank you. Sorry. Designa I'll start all over again. It's my pleasure to read a proclamation designating January 23rd through 29th, 2022, a certified registered nurse anesthetist week. Whereas, Certified registered nurse anesthetists, CRNAs, are highly educated and skilled practitioners, providing anesthesia care to patients in an Indian River County every day. And whereas, CRNAs have been pro providing high quality, cost effective anesthesia care in the United States of America for more than 150 years. And whereas, CRNAs practice in every setting in which anesthesia is delivered including traditional hospital surgical suites and obstetric op did you give me this on purpose mm -hmm. obstetrical <laughs> delivery rooms i'm very sorry that was good ambulatory surgical centers office-based medical facilities of surgeons dentists and pain management specialists u.s military facilities and public health services and veterans administration medical facilities and whereas CRNAs are qualified to make independent judgments regarding all aspects of anesthesia care based on their education, training, and licensure. And whereas CRNAs are courageously serving on the front lines of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic using their advanced skills in airway management, intubation, and ventilator management to care for the sickest patients. And whereas Indian River County is proud to recognize and honor the service of certified registered nurse anesthetists in our, count, in our county and worldwide. 
Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that January 23rd through the 29th, 2022, is designated as Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist Week in Indian River County, and the Board thanks these skilled professionals for their life-saving contributions to our community. Adopted this 18th day of January 2022 and signed by all five county commissioners. First, I'd just like to apologize for my mispronunciation of so many <laughs> words. But secondly, I'd also like to thank you guys so much for what you do in the community. Um, I know it's been a, a rough couple of years, but we are so grateful to have such qualified practitioners um, working alongside all of our medical providers. You guys do a great job and we thank you for it. And if you'd like to say a few words, please. Yes, first off, thank you for inviting us to represent our profession and, and for the proclamation celebrating this week. It's a national week uh, celebrating nurse anesthetists. I'm not used to seeing so many um, bright eyes this morning. Usually by the time I'm finished talking, everyone is, all my patients are asleep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to take a minute to say, yeah, CRNAs have been functioning uh, highly in this county for decades and decades. When I arrived over uh, 15 years ago, I'm a Florida native, but I've been in Indian River County about 15 years. Uh, there were some CRNAs that I had worked with that had been here since uh, the early 70s. And some of them have now retired, but it, it's nice that you guys have taken the time to uh, recognize all the hard work that, that they've done and that we're doing today uh, for the, the residents of Indian River County. You know, we, we thoroughly enjoy taking care of uh, the residents here and working hand in hand with the uh, other medical professionals in the county. Um, and just thank you. If I could briefly touch on that, um, whereas the number four, uh, to maybe clear up um, some confusion, that whereas does not say that CRNAs are independent of all physicians. But what it says is that based on our licensure in the state, and in some states in the country, you're correct, uh, Commissioner Moss, that CRNAs are working completely independent of physicians, but that doesn't mean that they don't ever consult other physicians that aren't part of their specialty, surgeons that they're working with or, or other physicians that are part of their specialty. But what that um, whereas directly speaks to is surgery is very fast-paced and things happen in the operating room um, instantaneously and require instantaneous intervention to save people's lives and get them through their surgery. And that's what that whereas speaks to. Our training allows us to make those independent decisions at the time that things happen um, so that we can save people's lives and get them successfully and happily through their surgery. So I hope that clears that, that up. It certainly does, and thank you very much for You're clarifying. Welcome. And thank you for your service to the community. I have uh, many nurses in the family and friends. So thank you. You've been on the front lines. Thank you very much. So Nicole, being married to Phil, you have to say a couple words, right? I mean, <laughs> I I have never been this nervous coming to his work. Usually, like, so I come and bring him lunch or something nice. <laughs> you didn't but, today. No. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for having us. This is a really special day. Um, I love being a nurse anesthetist and. I'm currently getting my doctorate degree, and it's just been wonderful, wonderful. Every day I'm learning something new, and I love taking care of our patients. And this is my new boss, Jack. <laughs> um, so the proclamation says uh, this has been going on for 150 years. So do they still teach you the thing about the shot of whiskey and biting down on a, on a piece of wood? <laughs> Is that, is that still working or? Some patients request that. Okay, all right, good. I just want, want to make sure we still keep the old, the old traditions as well as some new stuff. We, we recommend the newer medications, but. <laughs> you can still ask for the shot, okay, good. Well, Phil, I see you have to nose in here, so. Yeah, I, I can't pass an opportunity. I'll just say when the COVID <laughs> outbreak occurred, nobody knew what the consequences of it were, how potentially fatal exposure could be, nothing. And I begged Nicole not to go to work. I'm like, why don't you wait? Write it out. Don't do this. You know, you're really putting yourself in harm's way. And she wouldn't hear of it. And it was really a lesson in courage for me, I got to say. Uh, you know, she said, this is what I'm trained to do. This is my vocation. So be it. If this ends up being, you know, uh, something, something worse than we ever imagined, uh, I'm still going to answer the call. And they all did. And I thank them all for that. Great. Well, come on up. We'll get a photo with you. Good to see you, Nicole. How are you doing? Doing good? All right. Good to see you, Nicole. Nice to meet you. 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 Nice to meet you.
to finally meet you, Nicole. <laughs> awesome. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank, Thank you. You forget that whole where we're asked this question. Okay. I was going to turn that into okay. some kind of PowerPoint. So, yeah. Phil, from what I understand, Nicole doesn't listen to you much anyway, so. <laughs> She's a smart gal. Back for the anesthesia program, <laughs> uh, a lot of my coworkers warned me. They said, Phil, that's a mistake. She's going to put you to sleep one night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, very excited about the next two presentations. Um, as you all know, there's been a lot of discussion about the Union Rear Lagoon, um, amplified by the, the recent die-off by the manatees. And so um, back in, I think, November, we first talked to the board about bringing these presentations forward to learn a little bit more about what's going on. So right now, it's my um, uh, distinct pleasure to invite Dr. Lori Simpson from the Florida Oceanographic Society and she's going to give us a presentation on seagrasses in the Indian River Lagoon. So welcome, uh, Dr. Simpson. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you so much for having me, Commissioners. When I was invited to give this talk, you know, where do you start? Obviously, we're here having this conversation because of the manatee mortalities, and a lot of people are wondering what's going on, where we should be going forward, what happened to begin with. And so for this talk, I, while I want to talk about restoration, I really thought it was important to start at the very beginning. We have to start with the basics and understand seagrass ecology and what has happened to get us to where we are. So I apologize in the very beginning of the conversation because some things may be a little bit remedial, but I think we really need those building blocks to get to where we need to go. And so seagrass, it's a plant. It has to photosynthesize. I think that sometimes we forget that just because it's underwater, it does not need the sunlight to make energy. And so you have these leaf blades that terminate into these roots that anchor it into the ground. And then you have this rhizome. Actually, there's no way to point out. OK. So then there's the rhizome that has ends out in a growing tip. And this is really important, this rhizome, because most of the reproduction of seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon is actually by this growing tip. It's not by seeds, which a lot of plants that we know are seed-based. So in other parts of the country, they can go out, throw a bunch of seed into the water, and those will germinate and turn into seagrass. We do not have that opportunity. There's no seed bank here, and it has been very rare that someone has actually found a flower on any of our seagrass species. And so to restore seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon, we literally have to go out with pieces of seagrass and plant them out in the lagoon. The growth is seasonal. While we have seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon year around, it really only grows between April and September. And so we have some graphs here. This is Thalassia and Syringodium. And these top two graphs, uh, the staining crop, you can see that there's this increase of growth during the summertime. And then there's kind of a decrease in that staining crop during the wintertime. And not that it's disappearing, it's just not putting out the energy to grow because it's not the perfect conditions at that time. Seagrass also has an optimal salinity range. So we live in the Indian River Lagoon. This is an estuary, a brackish water system, where we have our fresh water that mixes with our salt water. And because of that, we have big swings in our salinity. Seagrass here has adapted to living between about between 14 parts per thousand and 45 parts per thousand. And that obviously is gonna depend on the season, but if you are below that threshold or above that threshold, this is when you start to see seagrass get stressed and die. This right here is syringodium, the manatee grass, and you can see that for a leaf extension, between zero and 15 parts per thousand, it's not doing so well, but its optimal salinity range is between 15 and 25. And so it really likes to stay in there. And if you throw a bunch of fresh water at it, whether it's pulsed or long periods, it will eventually stress and lead to mortality. In the world, there's about 52 species of seagrass. Some say 60, depends who you're talking to. But here in the Indian River Lagoon, we have seven, which is amazing. 
in most of Florida, there's about one to three species along the coast, but here in the IRL, being historically one of the most biodiverse estuaries in North America, we have seven. And you know, to have this biodiversity is absolutely fantastic and definitely something that we should be saving for future generations. But what makes seagrass so important in the Indian River Goon as well as globally? Well, seagrass is a foundation species. And a foundation species mean it anchors other species and other habitats. And so without seagrass, you don't have habitat that other plants and animals are living in or they're somehow connected to in one way or another. And there's a lot of important ecosystem services that this species performs in this coastal zone. An ecosystem service is a service output or process provided by that system that directly or indirectly benefits us as humans. So while being a foundation species, that is directly benefiting the other plants and animals in conjunction with it, but there are a myriad of ecosystem services that we actually um, really benefit from. And so quickly, these ecosystem services, I think most of us, the first one that will come to mind is that it's essential habitat in nursery grounds for a lot of important commercial fisheries. So whether it's recreationally or commercially, a lot of these fish species that we have here spend some, if not all, of their life cycle within the seagrass beds. It's also an important food source um, for grazers. Obviously, manatees, this is one of their prime food sources. They need to eat 100 pounds of seagrass a day to sustain themselves. Turtles, they survive on seagrass as well, as do a lot of other herbivorous fish. And so, you know, you lose this, these seagrass beds, you now are in turn losing that food source for a lot of these animals. Two that don't readily come to eye or you know come to mind because we can't really see it is sediment stabilization and the mitigation of wave energy. So this figure right here shows some black dots, and those dots are essentially just pieces of sediment, and they're moving through the water column as they get kicked up by the waves or by boat wake. And if there's nothing to stop them, they'll just keep moving and they won't settle out into back into the sediment. But the seagrass blades, as they're moving around, they're baffling out sediment particles. So they're getting hit by the seagrass blades, falling down, and getting anchored into the sediment. And so over time, down at the bottom, there's a graph that shows the height of sediment and then time on the x-axis. And you will see an increase in sedimentation over a specific period of time, which is um, very good for a lot of carbon sequestration in these systems. At the same time, we're also mitigating wave energy. You know, now instead of these, um, the velocity of water moving over bare sediment, you have the seagrass that's slowing down that, and which is also helping to take resuspended particles and help stabilize them on the sediment. It's also really important for biogeochemical cycling, so nutrient cycling. They'll take nutrients from the water column um, through just growth in general, and then they can transform those nutrients into a form that other animals can use or utilize. They're also very important in carbon sequestration. This is termed a blue carbon foundation species, where it takes CO2 from the atmosphere through photosynthesis, sequesters it in its biomass, and then if given the opportunity, that biomass will die and then be stored in its sediments for long periods of time, um, which we are gonna call carbon storage. And that carbon can be stored for millennia if left undisturbed, which is very important in terms of mitigation of global climate change or greenhouse warming. Unfortunately, though, while these, this foundation species has so many important ecosystem services, we have really um, done a number on it. There's several threats to seagrass here in the Indian River Lagoon. The first one, it's not the biggest threat, but it's still something that is detrimental to the species, is disturbance. This is a picture, I think, taken down in the Florida Keys of prop scars, and you can see as these boats mow down the seagrass, it pulls out those roots and those rhizomes, and those aren't those are just going to get resuspended into the water column and eventually die. They're not going to be able to settle back out, and you just hope that these prop scars, the seagrass around it, will be able to grow in over time. Another one is predation. So, you know, we talk about seagrass being a food source. It's a very important food source. But if we don't have enough seagrass to sustain those plant or those animals that are eating the seagrass, it becomes detrimental at a certain point. This is a picture taken from the Caribbean where they have put a cage around seagrass to keep 
turtles out of it. And you can see that the seagrass in the cage is looking absolutely fantastic, but around it, it is mowed down to the most part. And when these plants are stressed, they're not gonna be able to grow back the way that they should. And so there's a very fine line of how we should be moving forward with um, putting seagrass out in the lagoon, but also making sure that it's protected at least, at least initially from predation by some of these big grazers. But the big one that I know is on everybody's mind and we talk about a lot is that of water quality. Water quality has been the one-two punch for seagrass in the Indian River Lagoon, as well as many other places around the world. Um, and is one of the things that we really need to move forward in trying to repair so we can get seagrass back into the lagoon. But to talk about that, I'm gonna focus on this picture here. This is a picture taken above Taylor Creek, which is the C25 canal that um, empties kind of central Florida, the ag lands out west of town in Fort Pierce. And this water that is pulsing out of here or is being released out of here is all fresh water. And so if we go back to that natural history part that we spoke about, fresh water is a detriment to seagrass. If, it's, if you get under that 14 part per thousand threshold for several days or weeks, it will stress that seagrass and die. So because of how we have um, altered the water flow west of town, it's the timing, the distribution, and the volume that are really affecting the growth and productivity of these foundation species. Within this big freshwater plume that we see, you know, it's dark, it's black. This is a bunch of sediments. So the sedimentation, this organic matter that is moving out and essentially settling out on the seagrass, or if it's suspended in the water column, you can see that there's no way that light is going to be able to penetrate that and these plants are going to be able to be photosynthesized. And so this also stresses the seagrass. Within that plume as well, we have that organic matter, but we also have nutrient loading. And so while nutrient loading is a part of the conversation when we're talking about freshwater outflows or freshwater discharges, it's also something in some parts of the lagoon where we're worried about dated infrastructure. So we have nutrient loading that makes it into the lagoon one way or another, and that in turn is affecting the growth and productivity of these species. Nutrient loading definitely alters the species growth patterns. You know. If you give any sort of plant a limiting nutrient, it's going to shift its allocation of resources some way or another. And in the interim, that's fine, but at a certain point, it opens these species up to stress and eventual mortality. The one big thing with nutrient loading here in the Indian River Lagoon is not necessarily the alteration of the biomass of these species, but it's the algal blooms. So algae, um, phytoplankton, diatoms, if we give them a limiting nutrient and the, all the conditions add up just right, we have these big algal blooms that can last for weeks, a month. And as you can see from this picture, this is another example of how these seagrasses can no longer photosynthesize. Light is not able to make it through that water column that is completely covered up with this um, algal bloom. And so this is very important. Unfortunately, because of these threats to seagrass, we've seen that about 58% of seagrass has disappeared in the Indian River Lagoon since 2009. And, you know, this 58% is a little bit of a misnomer because we're, okay, what happened between 2009 and 1942 or whatever, so how much we've really lost, it's really hard to um, pinpoint. But this data has come from the South or St. John's River Water Management District, and this is the graph that it came from. And this, the green bars here are the aerial extent of seagrass. So in this 156 mile lagoon, this is just the extent that we know it's there. You know, it's there or it's not there. Now the percent cover is the actually really disappointing uh, stat on this graph and that is the black line. And as you can see, the black line has essentially almost come down to zero. And what that means is percent cover is you know, we know it's there, let's look at it. Is it sparse, is it patchy, is it continuous, and is it dense? Like how much percentage is covered in a certain quadrat? And since 2009, while we've lost 58% of our acreage, we've lost about 90% of the seagrass percent cover, which means out in the IRL, we have about 10% of our coverage within our area. And, and when in terms of the function that these seagrasses are performing, that's a very scary statistic. 
This is an example that you may all be familiar with. This is the flat off of Moorings Yacht Club. This is just a picture that I screenshot from Google Earth taken back in 2010. And this really dark area right at the edge of the um, golf course is a, just a beautiful flat. Uh, a lot of fishermen knew that that was the place to go if you wanted to go catch a nice trout. And we fast forward to 2010 or 2020, 2021, and that flat is completely gone. You can see there's a few little tiny relic areas of dark, which are seagrass, <coughs> but for the most part, it's all sand. And so if you were to be there and jump off a boat back in 2010, this is what that seagrass flat would have looked like. Very full, this is dense, this is wonderful coverage of seagrass that's performing all of the services. If you would jump into the same spot today, this is what it looks like. And so this, you know, where are those fish going to live? Where are those fish going to forage? What is going, what's holding that sediment? What is stabilizing it? Where is the carbon being sequestered? And so this loss of structure is leading to the loss of these ecosystem services. And unfortunately, we're seeing it right now with these manatee mortalities, but there are a lot of other services that are being lost at this time. So doom and gloom, what are we doing about it, right? There's a lot of organizations that have been working on seagrass restoration in the Indian River Lagoon for a while now. And I think everyone is just poised and ready to restore the lagoon when it's time to do so. And so at Florida Oceanographic, we started a program back in 2016 to start growing seagrass. Because historically, when you were going to do seagrass restoration on the IRL, you would go to a nice flat, you would dig that seagrass up, and then you would take it to another spot and plant it. Well, we don't, we would transplant it. We don't have that seagrass anymore. There's, that's not an option. And so our only option is literally growing it. And so what we do is we have a dedicated team of volunteers that will go out during breeding, breeding season, growing season, and they'll walk the shore of the Indian River Lagoon for us. And if they find a piece of seagrass that has been yanked up for some reason and has made it to shore, whether it's a manatee that pulled it up or a boat that um, pulled it up, if there's a piece of root on it, they'll bring it to us and we can plant it and it will grow in our um, nursery which is pictured here. So these are some tanks that we have. And then this picture all the way to the far right, this started with one piece of seagrass and given it the opportunity, this whole tank is completely full. And so here's a screenshot from Google from above our facility. We have 350 square feet of planting space and those blue bins. But once those bins start to get full or the seagrass gets root bound, then we have this almost 5,400 square foot area that we transplant out seagrass in. So this whole area actually looks like a beautiful functioning seagrass flat um, as it should look in the Indian River Lagoon. So when it's time, when we're ready to do it, we have the seagrass to get out there and to restore in the IRL. And we figured out how to do it with the help of volunteers. We found that it's very beneficial and very meaningful to get the community involved. Um, just getting everyone together, I think it, it really makes the, the mission go much smoother. And so what we do is we bring volunteers in and we mat the seagrass onto a burlap mat. And so we take just 16 shoots of seagrass and we tie it on with floral wire and then that burlap mat is essentially staked out into the sediment. So we just take it, we put it on the ground and stake in the corner with some bamboo skewers, the kind that you would use for your barbecue. And just in a few weeks, those seagrass mats will root and that burlap mat will break down in a few months. And so it's a biodegradable way to put seagrass back in the IRL. We did a project recently, well, back in April, almost a year ago, um, in Satellite Beach, where we did just that. And you can see those little dark boxes. Those are our seagrass plots that we put out. And within four months, there was 90% establishment in that, which is wonderful. And this just goes back to, you know, if we give the seagrass the opportunity, we put it in the right spots, it will, um, it will grow. And so in terms of restoration, I think a lot of people want to know how do we restore? What should we be looking for? Where should we be putting our time and our resources? And the first and foremost thing that we need to be concerned about is our water quality. You know, we need to get our water quality to a place where we're not having these freshwater inflows, our um, nutrient loading is much less. But if you're going to go out tomorrow and do it, the first thing is just keep your planting within a salinity envelope. Don't plant it in a canal. Don't plant it in right next to an outflow because um, that is almost definitely going to lead to mortality. Another thing is you need clean water. And I 
we did a little study over the summer, which I think really brings this home. We planted 16 shoots in a bunch of mesocosms, which is pictured here. And then we subjected it to different light levels. And so we had three light levels. There was high, which was just full sun. Then there was a medium, 55% shade, and then a low, 25% shade. And we did that by covering up these tanks with shade cloth. And these light levels were supposed to mimic harmful algal blooms or just something in the water column that was not allowing them to photosynthesize um, to its best capacity. And for the highlight treatment, the <laughs> one that had all of the sun, by September, there were 200 shoots in each of those mesocosms. So that's a 1,200% increase in seagrass growth in just a few months, which was absolutely fantastic. Not to be said for the medium and the low light treatment, though. In the medium light, the 55%, it really didn't do much. It stayed around 16 shoots um, up through September, whereas the low light treatment, it completely died after two months. And so this just you know brings to light that we really need to make sure that we are planting in a place where the water quality is um, good. Another thing to consider is plant during the growing season. You can plant these species outside of the growing season, but they're not utilizing the resources that they need to like really grow well. So don't put time and effort into planting outside of that. There's spatial factors to consider as well. Was there seagrass there originally? You know, go back and look on old maps and old data sets. If there wasn't seagrass there, there's probably a reason. Mother Nature's really good at showing us the way, and so don't plant in those areas. Um, sediment type is very important. While each seagrass needs kind of a different kind of sediment, m for the most part, they like sandy sediment. They do not like muck. They do not like anything that's unconsolidated. Um, if you're gonna plant in an unconsolidated area, they're not gonna be able to establish and root properly. And then there's also the intertidal location. So where in the water column you're placing them. If you place them too close to shore, they're probably gonna get ripped out because of boat wakes or storm surges. And so just keep that in mind. The last thing that we've really been interested in is co-restoration with other foundation species. So once again, mother nature, she has figured it out that if you put different species together, they help each other. And if you don't have both, you might not get the best productivity. And that project that I talked about earlier, Samson Island, was a great example of that. So we went in and we put seagrass in, but at the same time, they put in an oyster break. And so in the forefront of this picture, you can kind of see this white line. That's an oyster uh, reef. And so that oyster reef is acting as a breakwater to hopefully decrease any sort of surge that might stress the seagrass out. But it's also hopefully going to grow and attract other oysters. And those oysters are in turn going to filter the water and hopefully keep that water quality clean for the seagrass to grow. We also planted clams at the same time. Um, clams have been kind of a big conversation recently in the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, the fishery crashed here around 2010, 2011. And so because they are good at filtering water, there's been a big push to put them back out in the IRL. And these clams are providing seagrass with water quality improvement and also nutrients for growth. You know, they're right under the sediment surface and so they are directly giving the roots of the seagrass some um, nutrients to hopefully help them. But at the same time, seagrass is providing the clams with protection from predation kind of like a cover knitting so those red drum and those stingrays can't just get in there that easily and suck them out of the sediment and they're providing um, the claims with sediment stabilization and so when you bring them all together you're going to have increased survival growth and production of both of these really important species we're working on a project right now um, with Brevard Zoo and University of Florida. We're, we're doing actual research to try to tease this part a little bit better. And so we have um, a project that we're going to start in June where we're going to put out clams and seagrass together in some plots. And then another plot is going to be just seagrass. And so after you know we give them time to grow, we can compare these assemblages and see if there's any positive or, inter and, or negative interactions um, to these assemblages. And I bring this up because this project is happening in Brevard in 2022, but we actually just received funding to do that project here in Indian River County as well as St. Count Lucie County starting in 2023. And so moving forward, um, we would like these plots that we put these claims in 
um, seagrass out to be areas that are beneficial for not only the project but also for Indian River County and so hopefully moving forward we can keep the conversation open as to maybe a good place for these spots because we haven't picked those site locations yet. Um, and with that, I am happy to take any questions. I'm throwing out all the acknowledgments of everyone that's helped along the way. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Simpson. Commissioners, any questions? I, I have a couple. Um, you showed the, the picture of the Moorings grass flat. So I know that um, it's probably been longer than what I remember, but I'm saying five, six years ago is when we had some serious algae blooms in, in Indian River County. It seems that they're kind of more of an annual thing up in the Mosquito Lagoon and Banana River area. But in any river county, I don't think we've had any really big major blooms since that one year where we had the real bad one. So the moorings flat where it's not coming back, it, that's just because, again, there's a lack of seeds floating around. And really to restore that, you'd have to actually plant seagrass starters and, or shoots and then have them grow back in from there. Okay. Um, and I know you mentioned the, the predation and stuff. I've always kind of looked at like the manatees and stuff, kind of like cattle in a pasture on land. They may crunch it down, you know, right to the nub, but for the most part, they're not ripping roots out of the ground. And if you move those cattle off and give that pasture time, they'll come back. Is, is that mostly the similar way how the manatees and stuff work with seagrass? Yeah, in the perfect world, that's, you know, and there was plenty that they would be able to pull off of. That's what they would do. I've, unfortunately right now there's just not enough and so they'll eat it down as much as possible and instead of moving on then they'll come back and eat it down again and if you don't have that uh, shoot over time that's allowed to photosynthesize it's going to eventually die it's going to die off because right okay and then um will you be able to stick around after uh, abby's presentation on muck because i think in my mind the, the muck coverage is also tying in with how we can't get the seagrass to root strongly, as I think you said, they, they like a sandy soil where those roots can really dig in and, and get a grip so they don't get ripped out by the manatees or storm surge. So I'm, I'm interested to hear uh, on the muck side how that goes. Would you be able to stick around and we'll have maybe open discussion afterwards? That'd be awesome. Commissioner Fleischer. And, and I know that you have a, uh, an item coming right. up and I'm excited about that. Um, but I did want to ask that Dr. Simpson, uh, you, you mentioned uh, muck as being the, the, the major hurdle. Um, it's I think Abby's going to talk that, more on that. Yes, and I know, but you, you did mention that, that it was there. Uh, from your aspect, is, is muck, uh, the benthic level is, is, is usually a mobile uh, area is is that true that the muck does migrate you know that's a great question i but i'm gonna have to ask so, her but i think that i'm gonna let the expert behind me because we've talked about talk you know about the elimination of muck and i, I know yes. it's coming up yeah. so just in terms of seagrass the muck is if I was to go out to a site, someone said, I want to do seagrass restoration here, and I went out there and I was able to put my hand through it in a mucky layer, I'd say, sorry, we're not going to put our resources into that. Okay. There's just so many other places, and, you know, it's not a cheap endeavor. It's just a lot of resources that we utilize. And so I would look for a different site that had a more sandy sediment. And given the, the, the mass of the lagoon and the challenge, how um, and and your your project and and growth and restoration in in the controlled environment. How much of that could make the difference? What type of effort would have to be done to have that impact so we can turn this around? It's going to be a huge effort, question. but we're, we're already working in that direction. So my organization is doing this, but there are, you know, Harbor Branch is up doing this as well. I think MDC is about to put in a seagrass nursery. They're, what we're doing um, through the IRL NEP is kind of a restoration hub where certain organizations are poised and ready with the seagrass and from their area to get it back out into the lagoon. And so while it seems like it's a little bit off. We're ready, and we are making all of the efforts to get there. Thank you, Doc. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Dr. Simpson, thank you uh, very much, and uh, really appreciate it. If you can stick around, that'd be awesome. Well, 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have a, a presentation um, by Abby Gehring. Abby is a graduate um, in chemical oceanography from Florida Tech. She um, is working with Dr. Austin Fox, who has um, taken over the muck research from Dr. John Treffery. Um, Commissioner Flesher, I think you remember Dr. Treffery uh, presented to us a few years back. Um, Dr. Fox, I believe, had a, a class and teaching conflict, um, but he spoke very highly of Abby and said she's got the presentation and can answer all questions that we have. So with that, um, welcome, Abby, and I uh, look forward to your presentation on muck in the Indian River Lagoon. No pressure on that. No pressure on it. No. <laughs> uh, I just graduated my master's from Florida Tech on chemical oceanography. I've been working in this lab for three and a half, four years now um, with Dr. Fox, so hopefully I can answer all of your questions. But his email's on here. If you have any questions, he's happy to answer any of them. Um, I am as well. And so thanks for letting me talk to you about saving our sand and some of the impacts that we're seeing from our lagoon muck. So getting into the basics, um, I'll just put it out there to be really happy that you can't smell these pictures. Um, and so getting down to it, Muck is a local term that we've come up with to describe this really fine grain, organic rich sediment that we're seeing accumulate throughout the lagoon. Its compositional definition, it's 10 to 30 percent organic matter, greater than 60 percent silt and clay with a high water content, so porosity about greater than 0.9. We'll get into it in more detail, but this muck poses a problem because it's easily resuspended, so like we just kind of talked about, um, with the presentation beforehand, this can inhibit seagrass growth. And so with increased turbidity, you're blocking that sunlight from reaching all of your submerged aquatic vegetation, and they're not be going to be able to photosynthesize. Muck also consumes large quantities of dissolved oxygen. And this might sound bizarre to think about sediments consuming oxygen, but we'll get into that in um, a couple slides. It's characterized by the death of biota. Um, these are really hostile environments. Not a lot of organisms can live in these environments. Um, uh, hydrogen sulfide accumulates in these areas with no oxygen, and that's toxic to a lot of organisms and plants. Muck also continuously releases nitrogen and phosphorus um, into the water column, and so rather than sand being this healthy um, sediment that can actually be a sink for nutrients and so can actually remove nitrogen and phosphorus, now we're seeing this muck that's actually contributing to um, nitrogen and phosphorus in the water column. And so in our marine biogeochemistry lab at Florida Tech, we work to understand the impacts of muck. How does this influence nutrient cycling, nutrient processes, and the overall water quality in the lagoon? So um, this is Dr. Austin Fox. And so one of the ways we can do this is probing to identify muck thickness. A lot of the work we do is in Brevard County. Um, we have done a couple areas down here. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but you can see this specific site in Brevard County. It, the muck pit is greater than three meters deep. Again, be really happy that you can't smell the picture. Um, that was some nasty sediment down there very high nutrient concentrations and uh, hydrogen sulfide. We can also deploy benthic chambers, and this helps us measure nutrient fluxes, sediment oxygen demand, um, and also we can have laboratory experiments where we're testing kind of what conditions will release nitrogen, phosphorus, what conditions will actually decrease these fluxes, and wherever we go, we're always collecting some sediment samples. Uh, in the lab, we can actually take these sediment cores and squeeze them using pressure, and that's to extract this pore water that's in between these little um, particles. And we can analyze this later on for nutrients, hydrogen sulfide, and learn a lot about these sediments. So we can look at something like remote sensing to get a general idea of where we might be seeing these muck deposits. And so obviously these darker areas, um, it's possible that there's muck present here, or it could just be a deep area. Um, to validate this, we can actually go out and probe these areas. For example, this was one of the regions that we went out and probed for muck thickness. With probing, it's more of an operational definition. It might not match your compositional definition of muck. So in other words, you can probe something and it might not necessarily be muck. And so generally, below 30 centimeters, it's likely that that sediment isn't muck. Um, but as you get deeper and thicker than that, um, you're likely seeing muck. And so we can go out there probe and then also collect our sediment samples to see if it matches that compositional definition of muck. And so one thing I'll get into a little bit later on is that as we're seeing these muck deposits fill up, these really deep pits are starting to fill up, that muck is oozing over and that's starting to mix with this adjacent sand. And so again, that's not necessarily matching your compositional definition of muck, but we're still seeing really high fluxes now from the sand mixed with muck. 
And so we know that the presence of muck leads to degraded water quality and loss of ecosystem services. So again, we're e increasing that turbidity. It's really easily resuspended. I like to call it black mayonnaise. Um, that's kind of reminds me of, and it's really fluffy. Smallest of waves can cause a plume of it, and it's really dark, um, and it blocks that uh, sunlight from reaching your uh, submerged aquatic vegetation. One of the big things with muck and seagrasses is that there is no oxygen. You are going to see an accumulation of toxic hydrogen sulfide. Seagrasses cannot live with hydrogen sulfide present. Um, so again, like she said, if you have a muck deposit, you're not going to be wanting to even try to plant seagrasses here. We're losing viable habitat. Seeing this transition from sand to muck sediments, um, it's a really distinct difference. You can see how viable the sand is versus how anoxic and lacking of oxygen the muck is. We're also seeing increased nutrient fluxes from the muck, so this healthy sand, in other words, is able to actually, it can sorb phosphorus, it can remove nitrogen from the system, but now we're seeing this sediment that actually contributes to um, nutrients in the system. And virtually all the nitrogen that's fluxing from these sediments is in the form of ammonium, and this is a form that is preferentially taken up by harmful algae bloom species like Oriumbra. So that's this brown tide species that um, we've seen prevalent in the lagoon. Not only this, but it's also inhibiting our natural nitrogen removal processes. And so the lesser known ecosystem services like nitrification, denitrification, animox, these are all natural biological processes that are responsible for naturally removing nitrogen and phosphorus from these systems. These processes, though, take place in these healthy, sandy sediments. And so with this accumulation of muck, we're losing that habitat for these microbial communities. And so the seagrasses are, the manatees are dying because the seagrasses are dying. The seagrasses are dying, and that's kind of where the conversation stops. The seagrasses are dying, it's because the sand is dying. Um, and as crazy as that sounds, we have these microbial communities living within um, these microbes, and it's extremely important to our water quality. The bacteria that work to break down all this organic matter that settles onto this muck, they're actually consuming oxygen in the process. And so when I say sediment oxygen demand, I mean that all of these processes are utilizing that dissolved oxygen that's in the water column that should be used for other things like organisms breathing. <laughs> and so we're seeing higher, in, uh, higher sediment oxygen demand from these muck deposits compared to sand, and this can lead to more events of hypoxia and anoxia, so when there's no oxygen present in the system. <coughs> and so if we're going to pick one variable to monitor water quality, I'd have to say it should probably be dissolved oxygen. Um, Again, there's this really cool link between nutrient production and oxygen consumption, and so you can learn a lot from monitoring dissolved oxygen. It's very difficult to monitor nutrients continuously and well, and so accurately, but you can monitor, there's many different ways um, to do this with dissolved oxygen accurately, and you can draw a lot of inferences about nutrients from this oxygen data. And so this is an example. We are growing a network of bottom water dissolved oxygen sensors, and so looking at something like sandy sediments in the green. You can see your basic diurnal changes. And so during the day, you have sunlight, there's photosynthesis occurring, you have oxygen production. At night, there's no sunlight, no photosynthesis, but you're still having those organisms respiring and using oxygen. So it's normal to see these day and night changes. Now you can see if you look at something with muck, all of a sudden we're dipping below this dashed line quite frequent. And this is indications of hypoxia or anoxia. Um, this is happening much more frequently over muck deposits, and so these sensors are located right above these sediments, um, and we're seeing, you know, obviously in something where the sandy sediments, we're not seeing a lot of anoxia or hypoxia, so we're probably promoting things like nitrification, and we're going to see nitrogen removal. Something like muck, where we're going hypoxic very frequently, we're seeing a loss of these ecosystem services. And so... Looking, if you have a healthy sandy sediment, you can see from this graph on the right, you're going to have oxygen penetrating all the way to the surface of that sediment. That's going to create this oxic layer on top of the sediments, and this is extremely important for these microbial processes. With this oxic surface layer, you can have nitrification, denitrification, where ammonium can be directly converted to N2 gas and removed from the water column. Chemical, it's complex chemical processes, um, but it's again all part of the natural nitrogen cycle. And so these things are supposed to be happening on their own. We just degraded the habitats in which they're happening. With these healthy sediments, you can also bound phosphate and keep it and sorb it as um, bound phosphorus in the sediments, removing it from the water column. 
Now with something like muck, you can see that as you approach that muck, you're seeing a dip in your dissolved oxygen because it's consuming that dissolved oxygen. And now you no longer have this oxic layer of sediment. This means that while these bacteria break down this organic matter, now you're just releasing it back into the water column as ammonium or phosphate, and it's in available forms for things like algae. And so you can start to see your algae blooms forming. Algae blooms will just continue to add to the cycle. Those algae die, they start to break down, you have bacteria consuming oxygen, and we're right back in the cycle. And so a lot of monitoring efforts have been predominantly at the surface water, which is great. It gives us a generalized picture of what's going on in the lagoon. But we're really invested in finding ways to identify areas that need restoration and also to try to track the success of these restoration projects. And I think we can do that by targeting dissolved oxygen in the bottom water that's being directly impacted by these degraded habitats. And so again, we've been kind of building this network of dissolved oxygen sensors to help um, increase the spatial resolution and help kind of track successive projects while also identifying areas in need. I mentioned that muck contributes a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus input. So though this is data for the Banana River Lagoon, so it's up north. Um, we have a lot more muck up there, it's believed, muck distribution up there. You have a little more improved circulation down here, so it's thought that there's a little less muck down here. But you can see that in the Banana River Lagoon, muck, muck accounts for 40% of the nitrogen inputs and 49% of phosphorus inputs. And so this is just based on the surface area of muck and the flux data of muck. This isn't even taking into consideration that loss of ecosystem services that we're losing when we're losing this healthy, sandy, viable sediment. And so we know that understanding the natural system is essential to promoting successful restoration. And so the most important thing is stable dissolved oxygen. And so stable dissolved oxygen can promote these coupled nitrification, denitrification processes that are, will naturally remove nitrogen from the system. But expanding areas of hypoxia, they severely inhibit nitrification. If this one process is inhibited, it's going to inhibit the rest of the chain of these processes. We're not going to see that nitrogen removal. It also decreases the sorption capacity of sediments, and this is going to lead to higher concentrations of dissolved phosphorus. And so what can we do about the muck? Um, and so we can do dredging. Another means is capping. Uh, I know Dr. Fox would be happy to come down another time and give you guys a nice detailed talk about capping. Um, I'll focus a little more on dredging for today. And so regardless of the method, Dredging and capping, the ultimate goal is you want to decrease your nitrogen and phosphorus fluxes. You want to decrease your sediment oxygen demand. With sandy sediments, um, on average, it's consuming about 100 milligrams per square meter per hour of <laughs> oxygen versus muddy sediments. It's three times or more of that at 300 milligrams per uh, meter squared per hour. And so it's consuming a lot more oxygen a lot quicker than these sandy sediments. And so tracking dissolved oxygen can be an efficient way to evaluate the performance and quantify the success of these projects. And so um, I mentioned before, areas with low dissolved oxygen, you'll likely see high concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. And so with it, this is what this muck map is looking at. Um, this is up in the Cocoa Beach area. You can see that obviously in those areas that are red, pink, lighter color, you're not going to want to do something like seagrass restoration there. You need to kind of restore this habitat before you can start to do any other restoration efforts. And so specifically, this is a case study in 2015 and 2016 that took place in Brevard County. This was actually one of the first environmental dredging efforts in the lagoon, um, but they used navigational dredging techniques. And so looking at this probe penetration map, so we went out there with our probe, we identified muck thickness, we took sediments, um, sediment samples, uh, determined fluxes, and they found that there was 110,000 cubic meters of muck in this area. You can see those two predominant, really deep areas, um, kind of to the north and south of that bridge. Overall, there's more than six tons of nitrogen released from these muck deposits each year. And so, long story short, they did the dredging project, and here is the aftermath in 2017. And so you can see that those deeper pits, they're not as deep anymore. They're able to remove 53,000 cubic meters of muck, um, reducing 200 tons of nitrogen and 50 tons of phosphorus. It was removed as solids. This led to 50% lower fluxes after three months, um, after the dredging three months later. And so 
yes, it's less than it's less than 50% fluxes, and that's because they're still muck present. So again, this was the first environmental dredging effort in the lagoon. They use navigational dredging techniques, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. And so, if you're dredging something, for instance, like Taylor Creek, um, we have done some probing in Taylor Creek down here. If you're dredging a tributary, it's not necessarily a terrible thing. You're going to see the accumulation of new matter unless you completely eliminate those upland inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus and suspended sediment. Your, the most important thing to kind of take into consideration is your benefits to the surrounding area. And so the analogy we like, we like to use up in Brevard County is the trash can is full. And so what I mean by this, a good example is um, we did some sampling down here at Bethel Creek. We deployed benthic chambers and the sand, so it was still compositional definition of sand sediments adjacent to these, these muck deposits. And we were really surprised to see that the nutrient fluxes were almost equivalent from these sand um, than the adjacent muck. And so that's exactly what I mean by the trash can is full. These deep pits are now filling up. They're oozing over into these healthy, um, healthy surrounding areas. And so with dredging and when you're dredging tributaries, the most important thing to think of is that you're removing, you're helping kind of make these pits less deep, and you're going to accumulate eventually in time new material. But you're preventing that material from oozing into your healthy sediments nearby. And so that way, you're, pervert, you're preserving those ecosystem services in those areas. And I think. That's one of the most important things to keep in mind um, when you're thinking about dredging. And so how can we define success of these projects? Obviously, you want to decrease uh, your releases of nitrogen and phosphorus. You want to reduce your overall surface area of muck and improve your water quality. Hopefully, over time, you'll start to see your recruitment of biota because ideally you'd have more stable dissolved oxygen concentrations. And so. This is an example of our growing network of sensors, and you can see the St. John sensors at the surface. That's that blue line during the day, um, and so that's at the surface. But you can see that our nearby sensors deployed at the bottom, we're taking into account a lot more episodes of hypoxia or anoxia going on, and so we can use this to kind of, so for dredging projects, if we deploy these bottom water sensors after dredging and we see an improvement, you might not detect that improvement at the surface dissolved oxygen, but if you can sense that improvement in the bottom water dissolved oxygen, that's extremely important because that can help promote that surface layer of oxic sediment to promote these biological processes that can remove nitrogen naturally. Um, we're hoping to increase the spatial resolution of this. It's significantly growing up in Brevard County, um, and hopefully it can help us kind of identify areas in need and track the <laughs> progress of current restoration projects. And with that being said, if there's any questions, comments, or concern, I'd be happy to answer. Abby, thank you very much. Commissioners, any questions? Um, you, uh, go, uh, Commissioner Ehrman, go ahead. Thank you, Commissioner Chairman. Abby, have y'all, I mean, probably a very easy question, but I think that I'm asking it for everybody so they know. Do y'all have y'all defined a a primary source of the muck? Is it? I saw in your one graph you had fourteen percent of like, you know, the. the so the muck. Have y'all defined out actually like what the primary source is of the, of the muck by doing your studies? Is it? You can see, so if you were to take, we have like a sediment core, for example, in the lab, and you can see that after, you know, one to two feet of muck down at the bottom, you see this healthy, sandy sediment. And so you can date that back to 70 years before the population really began to boom here. And the muck is just a result of increased organic matter to the system. And so changing the hydrology of the system, having your inputs from freshwater inputs and rainfall, having your sewer and septic tanks, it's really just a result of everything coming together. And that's remained consistent. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to start removing what's already there because unless you can completely eliminate those upland sources of nitrogen and phosphorus, you're going to keep seeing an accumulation. So it actually creates hydrogen sulfide. I didn't know it actually. Yeah, when you have when it deteriorates and the decomposition and that comes up. 
So the decomposition um, leads to the consumption of oxygen. And so when you're consuming oxygen, you have to start to go to other different, something like manganese will be taken up and used. And then you get down to hydrogen sulfide. And so really when you smell like that rotten egg smell, you're driving past the lagoon, that hydrogen sulfide, that's because all the oxygen has already been consumed. And so now they're going to something like hydrogen sulfide. I probably have more questions. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Chairman? Um, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Commissioner Fletcher. I know you have probably. Uh, along the same lines, uh, when, you, when we're producing this gas, that's when it's underwater. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have that where it came from. We didn't have muck. Uh, we had sludge. And it was composed of different elements mm -hmm. and my misspent youth that's what I did that's what we studied and uh, when we would remove that from the water uh, we did have an odor but we had elevated nickel and phosphorus and uh, various components that would produce those gases when they were removed from the water when fine did a project here and everyone was so concerned about what we were going to be doing to the community and uh, the uh, after effects, as you can recall, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, there was grave concern that muck removal is a great idea, but what are we going to do about the odor that's going to be developed? And I did not want the, what was just stated to be misconstrued because muck here, when it's removed from the water, does not, it, the, the chemical process stops. And it does, in the dewatering and dehydration of the muck, it turns into a rather solid brick that does not emanate an odor. So with dredging, um, they'd likely have a DMMA, so a dredge material management area. And so with that, you would have to pump the dredge into that site. They have a whole settling out process um, and everything. And then you actually have to treat that effluent water. So you have to remove the nitrogen and phosphorus from that water before it can be discharged again. And so is your concern, so they do have, so when dredging and looking at what to dredge, like something that they have to take consideration is arsenic levels. and so. Right. That is something that you definitely have to take into consideration. And, and, and I, I just wanted to point out as we're, we're having this discussion that uh, I, I think a lot of people had called in and said, I guess FIND is not doing that project. <laughs> All they saw was the fence and the impound area, but they did not see or uh, they did not smell anything of action. And I think that's a very valid point to bring up now, that uh, if, if we were to engage in that process, that that process does not have a serious concern for public uh, contact and uh, public nuisance uh, in, in the process. Um, I think it's really going to kind of come down to site specific and so there have been dredge material management areas in Brevard County. I'm not familiar if there are conflicts with the community with those um, but obviously it wouldn't carry through with permitting and get approved if there were going to be health impacts to it. Um, I do know when I pass on in any river uh, when I pass in US 1 uh, uh, going up just past uh, Barefoot Bay and Palm Bay that uh, we always come into an impact area. And that's because that action is taking place. It's underwater and it's very shallow water and it's just fighting itself and it, we always have that odor. Once you pass that area, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've yeah, that's, could take a sample it out. It smells like rotten egg. That's the result of hydrogen um, sulfide accumulation. And so that should just kind of be an indicator. You should probably be like, wow, if I put oxygen probe in here, there's probably no oxygen. These sediments are completely anoxic. Well, there's definitely no fish there. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair. Mr. Ross. If I may. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing this forward today. And thank you both uh, for being here. I appreciate all, this, all of this information. 
And it appears that there are multiple um, actions that might be required to remedy the situations that each of you um, has described, and of course, there's a relationship between the two. Um, but what I'm what I'm wondering, and uh, I think one of you referred to it, and perhaps you both did, is that we here locally are actually in better shape um, in some ways than than Brevard. So um, my question to you, beyond remedying um, what problems are existing here, what, if anything, can we learn from Brevard in order to prevent problems in the first place? And either of you, or if both of you can respond to that, appreciate it. I think the one of the big things that contributes to the depiction that the water quality is better down here is there's definitely that enhanced circulation and so that does make a difference and so muck is really fine grain so it's going to accumulate in those deeper areas with confined and restricted circulation um, and so that is one thing that is improved down here versus Brevard County. Do you have anything you want to add? <laughs> I second that. I actually just recently saw a graph that they used aerial satellite imagery to show residence time of water through the Indian River Lagoon. And that area up in Brevard and the banana, like that water sits there for up to three years before it ever gets out. And so that's contributing to your muck, that's contributing to these algal blooms. Whereas down here, you know, it's some in some places it could be zero to 50 days or, you know, a month, which is a much better place to be. And so it's kind of just that luck of the draw that you're in an area that we have um, tidal flushing due to. So it's a, it's the natural configuration then of the of our, our local uh, geography. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, of course, I think Brevard has a much larger population than we do. So I'm wondering if um, you know development is a is a concern or should be a concern go, going forward as a contributing factor. 100%. Yeah, and I think that the lagoon. I guess the hydrology of the lagoon is no longer natural. This is we have completely changed the hydrology of the lagoon here and there. Um, so it's to say we're going to go back to exactly historical conditions, it's just not possible. We need to focus on moving forward and restoring what we can in the meantime. Um, I know according to the Sorrel Plan, the Brevard County Save Our Indian River Lagoon Plan, one of the most effective ways of limiting your nutrient inputs is education. Um, and so having these conversations, educating the community um, about what they can do and their small impacts because you have one person, they might not think it's a difference, but all of a sudden you have a whole community stepping up and doing this small change, and you're going to start to see improvements. Good. Thank you. Um, so looking at our local situation, it seems to me we, we kind of have two paths we should follow. One is um, to get an idea of what the muck coverage is in the lagoon in Indian River County to try to identify areas with low muck coverage to where Dr. Simpson or another one of the groups could do seagrass restoration. So in my mind, that's one path we, we need to follow. Find those areas where we think we can put grass in and maybe again do an oyster reef or something to protect it until it gets rooted and growing and go from there. The second is those areas with high muck coverage. Um, you know, we're spending millions on nutrient removal projects upland. But from what your graph says, it could be the majority of our nutrients are just coming from being recycled through the muck. Is that correct? But the correct? nutrients in the muck are a result of years of... Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So that, that, that's been decades of coming in. Um, so when, you mentioned capping. Is that where they just take like a big giant sandblaster and they just spray enough sand to, to bury the muck? Is that capping? Yeah. This is a very strategized... Um, procedure they have identified you know possible success in limited areas and it's definitely something that we're still looking into and researching in Brevard County as a viable means of muck remediation okay have you or anybody looked at in those areas of the low dissolved oxygen which would indicate high muck and and the nutrients just recycling um, has anybody looked at aeration of those areas in the lagoon and does that help or is that not worth doing so Dr. Fox has actually done quite extensive work in projects with aeration. I'm sure it's also another talk that he could spend a decent amount talking about. Um, and one of those areas was in Turkey Creek, so that dredged area. They did do aeration. There were 
benefits, but it was limited to the local area. And so, again, if you can't decrease that sediment oxygen demand, so how much consumption from those sediments, you can put oxygen in there, but if it's being consumed right away, it's not really doing much good. And okay. so there was a limited extent to that success. But we have actually been collaborating with um, Brevard County for their restoration efforts um, with our DO sensor network. Our ultimate goal is to increase the spatial resolution so we can actually map the extent of hypoxia in the lagoon. And this can kind of help target where there should be restoration efforts um, and then tracking the success of something like dredging or capping. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like we're the, the, um, the ugly little stepsister here. You know, we got, you're up in Brevard working up there and Dr. Simpson's down in Martin County and any River County, we're kind of stuck here in the middle. Um, probably you, you couldn't answer this, maybe Dr. Uh, Cox could, but what would it take to, to do a study in the lagoon, in the Indian River part of the lagoon to map those areas where restoration might be feasible question for you and then dr simpson it, you know how much can you gear up you know if we say hey we've got 50 acres that abby says would be great and you you concur you know how quick could you ramp up so you know one question is what would it take to identify potential areas for restoration in indian river county and then dr simpson is would there be capacity to fulfill those areas so I know we're always looking for collaboration, expanding the network. Um, it helps to have, if you have surface DO and you have bottom water DO, that helps modelers um, be able to more accurately model the system. Um, and so I think that is one thing, is you have to have the data there to tell you what is going on in these areas. And so um, we have the, the Clean Water Coalition here, and several of their members are here now, and they do a lot of volunteer water quality sampling as well. Um, is there a technique that you can train them to do and how to collect the data that you need to help do that mapping and modeling? Um, we actually haven't done much with uh, community involvement in our lab, but that would be something that would be really interested. I know that they do have community outreach, and so the Samson Island, that was all volunteer-based. I'm sure people could be trained to take water, mint, or water samples and collection. It's just finding a means of processing those samples, I think. Um, but I think that there's enough people involved in restoration of the lagoon that it, it is a multifaceted approach. It does take collaboration and talking between counties and kind of forming a plan to get everyone involved. So you can come together and see what data are we lacking, what data do we need, what do we need more of down here, what we do, do we need more of up north, south. Um, it's definitely going to be a huge multifaceted approach. Okay. Along those lines with water quality, uh, Florida Oceanographic Society, we actually have a citizen science water quality monitoring program where we have 50 volunteers that monitor water quality within the Indian River Lagoon and St. Lucie Estuary every week. And it's very simple. Like, we don't, they are given their little kits. They have to go. We give them a little training how you do this, and then we send them on their way, and they send us the data every week. So that could be something that if you have a team of volunteers, whether it's Clean Water Coalition, and want to be involved, we can probably set something up for you along those lines. Um, in terms of capacity for putting seagrass out in the IRL, that whole lagoon side at 5,400 square feet is all seagrass, and it's ready to go when the time is right. So. So if we did identify, like, like, how about the moorings area? Um, let's say that's still good sandy soil. It just hasn't recruited because there aren't plants there. Um, would that be something if we said, hey, we're going to fund you to come up there and, and plant it and protect it and grow from there? Yeah, and I think along those lines, if we wanted to talk about that site for that clam seagrass project, that would actually probably garner a lot of community involvement and support because of the fact that everybody knows about it. You know, a lot of people that, that's flat has been near and dear to their heart. And so we can get the boots on the ground volunteers from Indian River County, as well as the science behind it, and hopefully come up with a really great project. Okay. Um, commissioners, uh, we're going to segue into 14E1 now um, under my agenda item matters. Um, so both of you, well, let me thank both of you for being here. I really appreciate it, and I've found this tremendously helpful and interesting. Um, and Dylan, um, we'll have to look at procurement here and things like that, issues, but um, 
kind of, I, I guess I, I, I'm asking if both of you could maybe come up with a proposal um, for the county of what it would take to, to get to those things that I highlighted earlier, the mapping, the potential areas, and a, a cost per square foot of a seagrass planting and clams and oyster and all that. Um, I realize that y'all do use a lot of volunteers and stuff, which is great. And we probably can scare up a bunch of crowd here, but I'm sure there's a cost involved too. Um, and then we would have to look at if we can sole source it based on their expertise in the lagoon and you just can't, you know, go on, go on to Amazon and order some seagrass or anything. So I think we can um, work with that. But would that be something you all, one, would be interested in doing? And <laughs> would you be able to? Because, um, and I know it's going to be a long process because it's, it, we're, like you mentioned, we're really down on the seagrass. But if we can um, find some areas relatively quickly where we can start doing some restoration efforts, in my mind, that's a good first step moving forward. And then working on the muck issue, more of a longer term project, um, looking at the different areas of, of how we can remove it, address it, cap it, whatever you know makes the most sense. Um, but, and I know that muck has accumulated over a long period of time, but it's, it, from Abby, what you said, it's, it's loaded with nutrients that keep recycling. So to me, getting rid of the muck is, is a critical thing to restore the health of the lagoon. So um, I, I just saw that out there. If both of you would be able to um, work with our staff, I'll, I'll have our folks get a hold of you um, and see if we can fine tune this. Um, if that, if the board um, is okay with that, or Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Fletcher. Yes, um, I, I, I'd like to uh, just uh, clarify. I, I think the councilor can uh, probably identify it now, not to put you on the spot, but uh, that sole sourcing could could occur, correct? Uh, based on their level of expertise and what they're doing? I, I think if we can work with them on, on a potential proposal process, they're either through a P3 concept or, or other purchasing mechanism. We'll certainly work with Jennifer Hyde on that issue. I, I would like to state, um, just wanted to thank Abby. Uh, I, I can tell this board it was probably almost 25 years ago that a uh, much younger Dylan Reingold as a graduate student in biological oceanography at uh, Florida Tech came forward to the Beach and Shores Committee of Indian River County to give a presentation. And based upon what I heard today, I can tell you Abby's was a much better presentation than my presentation. Um, but certainly just wanted to thank her uh, on her on her presentation. She did, she did a, a fabulous job. Thank you. It, it, thank you for that. Um, and if, if this motion happens to roll through today and uh, we do have this action taken, I can look in the audience and see the amount of volunteers that are represented. I mean, you just, just say hello, because uh, we, we have a lot of individuals that want something to happen yesterday. And today it's happening, so I mean, I'm happy to hear them speak, and I know that the chairman can't make a motion. So I would like to make a motion, and he's going to second it with full articulation. Wonderful. Mr. Chairman. So your motion is kind of what I just said two minutes ago. That's correct. I, 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 I wanted it condensed <laughs> that we're going to uh, direct staff uh, to identify uh, with these two entities on an identification project and a scope of future endeavor for muck removal and seagrass planting. And I'll be glad to second that motion. Dylan, are you good with the wording? Yeah, I, I, I understand it simply as uh, staff is directed to work with both uh, Florida Tech and with the Florida Oceanographic Society on uh, examining and putting together a scope of work uh, revolving around muck removal and seagrass planting. Does that? It, it may not so much uh, muck removal, but identify yeah. areas where seagrass planting could happen relatively quickly. So not as much of the muck removal, but as the identified seagrass planting uh, possibility. Yes, I think identify the, the muck coverage in the county, the and then we can, the we can figure That's out where correct. each goes. 
Mr. Let me, let me, I got I Commissioner Adams we could, first. We could, uh, uh, Commissioner, I got sorry. Commissioner Adams first. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were talking. Oh, no, no, that's okay. I just wanted to, to throw in two cents. Um, so I know that the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program has been working a lot on um, mapping in the lagoon in our area, and I, I see Paul back there. He's on the citizens' advisory aspect of that, and he might speak to it a little bit more. But we did have a presentation at our last meeting regarding their mapping efforts and introduced to um, their new mapping expert that's probably working with you guys and gathering a lot of this data. Um, they've also, as the lady said, have been involved with the zoo on their future um, seagrass nursery, for lack of a better word. Um, so I think there's some opportunities to kind of bring all that together and probably maybe provide some funding sources for any future projects that might come out of this motion. But um, I just wanted to throw that in, and, and I'm sure Paul has more to add to that as he looks like he's teed up back there. But. Yep. Okay. Mr. Sure, Aaron, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I was just going to comment on what you said about the seagrass restoration maybe happening a little sooner than the month. Because I know with with some of the folks we have in here that are on that lagoon every day, they can sure you know help Dr. Simpson identify some sources for seagrass that we could probably you know look and look and do uh, absolutely do right away. I would think, uh, and, and I would actually like to hear from some of our, yeah, I, some of our local Dr. Simpson. Would you and Abby be willing to stick around? And uh, I think a few people from the public might want to speak. And could you still stick around and answer any questions? Thank you both very, very much. Really appreciate it. Captain Paul, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Joe, can you leave the cold weather up north, sir? Uh, I'm, I'm not used trying. to wearing Try. this kind of attire. Thank you very much. I'm Paul Fafeta, um, fishing guide. Clean Water Coalition. Uh, I want to absolutely applaud you all for bringing this forward. Uh, it's crucial uh, that we get this lagoon back the way it was when some of us grew up here and enjoyed it. Um, one of the things that we need to keep in mind with everything that's been told so far today is if the water quality isn't sustainable, there's no sense in planting grass or oysters or clams. We got to keep the nutrient loads down from the septics, from the storm water, from the fertilizer. We applaud you for the biosolids, uh, um, you know, moratorium. Moratorium, uh, moratorium on that. But there, there's so many other things that need to be done. Clean Water Coalition is doing water sampling. We've just completed two years um, in the lagoon for enteric bacteria, and you'll be hearing more about that. The results um, broadcasted here shortly. We've also got the spraying that's being done. Everything out west comes east. The spraying in Blue Cypress, the spraying in um, all of the canals out west, everything dumps into the lagoon eventually. As Dr. Grant Gilmore will tell you, even the pesticides are having an adverse effect on um, our sea life. So it's, it's a culmination of things, and I again I applaud you all. The Clean Water Coalition is 100 and 20, 150 percent behind any efforts going forward, as, as you all have described today, and uh, um, we appreciate it. Uh, we communicate frequently with Dr. DeFries up in the IRNL NEP um, with his stuff. We're, we're pleased that he is, mm -hmm. his cancer is in remission, although his strength hasn't come back yet, and he's doing good in that arena. Um, and and the, the brilliant minds that we've got here within the area with, with um, Florida Oceanographic with Harbor Branch with Orca and so many others. So thank you and thank you again for bringing it forward. Thank you. Anyone else that wishes to speak on the presentations or the motion on the table? Good morning. Good morning, Judy Orcutt, um, Clean Water Coalition also. I have a couple of questions I just want to have clarified because this is a public meeting and hopefully the public's watching. So to these ladies, I think it's really important that we discuss the dredging techniques for muck removal because there is a project um, in the planning stages now that is going to require, we, um, it's called, it's mechanical dredging. So I'd really like them to um, discriminate between, I believe it's called hydraulic dredging versus mechanical dredging, but I'm going to let them, I would hope that you can. Mm 
not the one to do that. And so, Judy, 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 the difference would be like mechanical would be like a big track hoe scooping and then dumping it, you know, on a barge or something. Obviously, there'd be much more potential for loose sediments get resuspended, things like that it would be much messier. Um, I would think that normally in a, in a muck removal, you'd use hydraulic dredging, where you're basically like a giant vacuum, just sucking the water and muck up. It is pumped to a, a spoil management area, and then the water settles out and is dewatered. So I, I don't think, and this may be a little putting the cart ahead of the horse, but I don't think we would want to do a muck removal with mechanical dredging. I think it'd have to be a hydraulic dredging project. In order to contain the nutrients. Yes. But otherwise, you're just letting them flow back in. Yeah, the mechanical would create a, a and you could put turbidity curtains up. They're not really going to work. So you'd be creating a mess mechanically. So, and I can't say 100%, but I would think the suction or hydraulic dredging would have much, much less potential for stirring stuff up and creating a mess. Thank you. Um, also, I had heard Dr. Treffrey talk many times about how sod was one of the number one sources of the muck material because if you think about it, sod is grown out in a muck field and then it's brought to the sandy soils on the development areas, brand new development areas before it has a chance to have the roots grow in. It rains and so that muck washes off. So I think that's an important point for the public to know that, and, and for uh, regulation, county regulation, city regulation, you know, to move the planted material for sod back away from water's edges, canal edges. It's, it just seems like a logical thing to do if we're trying to reduce muck. And also the plant material from landscaping, of course, and I think People, you know, stormwater folks have certainly um, emphasized that point. And one question I had relevant to the Moorings um, Flats area, which I, Captain Paul and I went out and looked at that not too long ago, and um, it is just like a desert. And I know that it, uh, in recent years there was an oyster project in that vicinity, oyster bags being placed. So I'm just curious. If those are there, did they get buried? You know, what's the status? Does that, because it is a big area of a nice sandy flat area, do we need to do oysters also to, to stop the boat wake? Because I know boat wakes are a big issue and there's 700 boats in the moorings coming and going. So um, that's, that's a Hopefully thought. Dr. Simpson can address that for you. Okay. Wonderful question. I think a lot of it will come down to going out and doing a site assessment. So in order to go out and do any sort of seagrass restoration, oyster restoration, you have to get permits from the Department of Environmental Protection as well as from the Army Corps of Engineer. And they have a very specific um, amount of requirements. And so, you know, we can go out and we have one thing in our mind, but by the time it's all done, it could completely change. Okay. And so, yeah, we're going to start with that conversation of maybe we can do oysters and seagrass, but that could totally change once we get out there. Gotcha, thank you. Another area that I think of as being a beautiful area for potential seagrass restoration is where you're having your current projects on the islands, Earman Island and mm -hmm. those areas. There's that beautiful sand spit that sticks out and, and um, a lot of times people anchor their boats there and just play and run around on the sand spit, but perhaps it could be an area, it seems like it's got fairly good clarity, it's shallow, it's sandy, you know, that it could be marked off and planted and protected to be a seagrass area. So that's all my question. Yeah, and Judy, I'm not, I don't recall a uh, oyster project over by the moorings. I know. Um, yeah, the Rotary did it. Did they? Well, I know Paul Drittenbass did a big. Um, yeah, that was the intercoastal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. wasn't it in the moorings? Okay. Paul did a project where he marked the, the seagrass bed there, but I don't think they put okay. oysters down. Okay. But. Mistaken. Thank you. you clarify yeah, let, that. Let me clarify, clarify that. that. Yeah. We did a uh, project with Paul and the uh, Rotary, and it's uh, between the moorings and Round Island. It's about a foot of water. Um, again, because of the water quality issues, the oysters, while they have brought some development and some uh, animal life to them. They haven't taken off like they, uh, we had hoped they would. We also did another project 
across from Harbor Branch on that little shoal island, uh, which is just north of the island they call Bird Island. And uh, because of the boat wake and the lack of enforcement up there, that one all was pulled up um, by DEP. And then the third one that we had done was just north of Grand Harbor on the first island north of that on the west side. And uh, a hurricane came by and ripped everything out. And again, it was all held down with uh, um, the concrete donuts that you put around your sprinkler heads, and then we put uh, reinforced it with anchors that you'd use to secure your uh, storage sheds. And the wake action just ripped all that stuff out. So mm. um, again, because of the, as, as Dr. Simpson said, because of the regulations from DEP and the Army Corps, um, the spat, you put a spat trap out, you start checking for the spat, which are the eggs of the oysters, and um, then they come out with the grids and they look for the uh, Seagrass, you can't put oysters down where there's any, any sign of seagrass. So there's a number of um, hoops you've got to jump through, and uh, okay. we're looking forward to doing it. Again, it's just we got to get that water quality to where it will sustain the effort and the money that we put forth. Um, yep. So thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Kim. Anyone else? Welcome. Good morning. Jean Cashpole from the Indian River Neighborhood Association. First, I want to compliment you on taking action to actually get a study done about muck in our Indian River Lagoon area. I mean, we've been waiting a long time for action. We've done a lot of research. There's a lot of data out there, but the action is really what we need. So I'm appreciative of the fact that you're moving forward to take some action. And then I have a question and a comment. The question is for Dr. Simpson. I know you have this um, area in which you are sampling, uh, growing, or replanting seagrass, and that's up in Satellite Beach, did you say? That was one project that we did it, yes. Okay, now, why did you choose that area? Why is the water quality in that area conducive to growing this? And what is the reason why that water quality might be better there? Um, wonderful questions. This was a project that Satellite Beach pulled in multiple different collaborators. Uh, Dr. Fox was actually on the project looking at DO, I believe. We had um, other organizations bring in oysters. And so a lot of times, because the Indian River Lagoon is so big, 156 miles, we can't do this all by ourselves, right? And so all of these organizations, we work together. And so we were approached by Satellite Beach to come and to put the seagrass in. They had already done all of the um, water quality parameters. They had done the study to make sure that it was the best place. That specific area, it just has a really nice sandy bottom. It's kind of cut back up um, in an area that there's no, like, there's not a lot of housing developments. That's and, what I wondered, right. And, yeah, so it's um, the land, Samson's Island, is a nature park. And so you can go back in there, and there's trails. And those are the best places to work, right, because they're butted up right next to another foundation species. And so that was definitely one of the reasons that that was chosen. And it did so well, and there were, all these collaborators came together that they actually got funding to move it down. Like, now we're going to do the next acre um, right adjacent to it, which is absolutely fantastic. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this points to what Captain Paul just said. I mean, we're wasting our time unless we get our water quality up to a standard where we can actually get some growth of seagrass. And to that point, I want to point out the herbicide spraying. Uh, we talked about what the content of muck is, and 30% of it is organic matter. And yet we are still herbicide spraying and allowing some of the plant material to retain, to stay in the water where it decomposes and also ends up being uh, contributing to the muck. So there are a lot of things that we need to pay attention to, obviously, to get to that water standard level. But moving forward is always our goal. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and call the motion. Um, I, we, I think we've taken up a lot of the time for Dr. Simpson and Abby, and we'll take a break, and then we'll have more discussion afterwards. But I would like to let them get going, so I'm going to hold off on any future uh, public discussion right now. So, commissioners, we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Flesher, second by myself. I think Dylan and the clerk have a clear understanding. Jason? 
Yeah, just for clarity on the muck, we're looking at more of like a, a study of the muck and the locations where we might do a future muck project. I, I think project. the study to look at areas that are good potential for seagrass restoration and then areas that might need advanced uh, removal uh, techniques. Okay, thank you. Seagrass as a major and muck as a minor. I think that'd be the secondary. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Most certainly. All right. So no further discussion. All in favor of the motion signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. We're going to take a 10-minute break. So we will come back at 5 after 11.
We're good. We're good? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I just say one yep. thing? Um, during the break, I invited Mr. Cannon. He's our new representative from St. John's River Water Management District just to sp speak to us for a moment, and I wanted to welcome him to his new position and also to the state. Sure. Come on up, James. Thank you. Appreciate the, uh, appreciate the invitation. Um, commissioners, my name is James Cannon. Uh, as mentioned, I am the new intergovernmental coordinator, uh, government affairs rep for the St. John's River Water Management District out of the Palm Bay office. Uh, I've been with the district. I started December 15th, moved down here from Pittsburgh. Uh, clearly, given the weather reports, we've picked the right time to come down. Uh, there's about a foot of snow up there, and it's eight degrees this morning. Um, and also the Steelers, you know, ill fortunes, but that goes without saying. Uh, but yeah, we're, I'm excited to be here. Um, it's I started right before the holidays, so I managed to miss a lot of the activity. Uh, I know I did an initial outreach via email uh, to all of you, so the name should be familiar, but I've always been a big proponent of face-to-face -face interaction. I think there's something to um, that's missing with, with online interaction. So um, happy to be here. A little bit about my background right before uh, taking this position with the, with the district. I had a similar position, uh, external affairs, government affairs for a large electric utility in the Northeast. I uh, did that for a couple of years. Prior to that, I worked at a nuclear plant uh, handling site communications. Uh, and prior to that, I was in oil and gas in Pennsylvania, uh, spearheading the local and county government efforts um, for the natural gas development in the Marcellus Shale for, uh, for close to a decade. Um, anything prior to that's kind of a mishmash. A uh, little bit of trivia, I did graduate from Florida Atlantic University. Uh, I lived here for a couple of years in the 90s following some military service. Moved to Florida for several years, finished my degree, and then was dumb enough to move back up north. Um, so I'm, mm. I'm atoning for my mistake by coming back down here. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the new government affairs person for this region. So obviously, if you need anything from me, I'm more than happy to, to track down the information uh, and get the answers to the questions that I can. Um, great day to show up as well with the two presentations. Those were fantastic, uh, very educational. I'm trying to take in as much as I can with respect to any uh, water issues in this region. So this was, this was phenomenal. And I can't thank, I wish the two ladies were still here so I could thank them. Um, you know, that's the kind of information that I'm trying to trying to take in. Uh, Commissioner Moss uh, asked me at the break, and I I, prov I have to confess I'm not sure, um, but with the proposal for the for the the projects that were teed up, um, I'm going to look into I'm going to look to see if those might qualify for some kind of funding from the district. Uh, we have the cost share program, which has been highly effective to date. Um, offhand, again, I don't know if those if the proposal would fit. The district criteria, but I'm, I'll look into it when I get back to the office and provide a response as soon as I find out one way or the other. Great. And do you prefer Jim or James? Uh, either one. Jim is fine. James okay. is more of a family thing, more of a <laughs> just, but whatever people are familiar with. I've had friends over the years refer to me as James. I've had, I had one friend who was from Wyoming, used to call me Jimmy. <laughs> um, really annoyed me, but he was a good friend, so I let it slide. But okay. uh, J Jim is fine. Well, good. Well, welcome and uh, nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, approval of the minutes of November 2nd, 2021. Move approval. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carries 5-0. Just one informational item. We did have our new library uh, director here this morning, but I think Mr. Zito sent her back to the library to work, so we'll get a chance to maybe meet her at a future meeting. Um, take us on to the um, consent agenda. Commissioners, does anybody wish to pull a consent agenda item for future uh, additional discussion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull 8H. H, mm -hmm. okay. Anyone else? Is there anyone in the public that wishes to pull a consent agenda item for additional discussion? Seeing none, commissioners? Move as amended. Give the uh, motion to Commissioner Flesher, second by Vice Chairman Ehrman. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Commissioner Moss, item 8-H. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, I just had a, a question or require, I think a clarification might be required on the license agreement, uh, number 8A, and it says a tenant shall a comprehensive general liability insurance. I think there might be some words that need to be inserted there. I think it's just maintain. Okay. Um, obtain and maintain. Yeah. Okay. So um, with that, um, I'll move to approve. Second. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Moss, second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. We get to the first of our six, five public hearings. 10A1, amendments to Chapter 304, Life Support and Wheelchair Services of the Indian River Code of Ordinances. This is a legislative matter. And who's going to? I will do that. Dylan will kick this off. Thank you very much. Uh, per Chapter 304 of our Ordinance Code, the county issues certificates of public convenience and necessity for various life support services. Uh, part 2 of uh, Chapter 304 addresses wheelchair vehicle services. Per county staff recommendation, on October 12, 2021, the board authorized the county attorney's office to draft an ordinance which eliminated part two of chapter 304 and making some technical changes to the other aspects of chapter 304. Under this ordinance, I just want to be clear, under this ordinance, the county will no longer be involved in regulating the number of businesses who operate these types of services. County staff felt it was best that we just not be in the, in the business and operation of regulating the economics of the wheelchair vehicle services. And simply that was really the issue there. Uh, with that, just turn it uh, over to back over to the board. County attorney recommends that the uh, chair open the public hearing, take any public comment, and then approve the ordinance and be available for questions. Thank you, Dylan. Commissioner's questions of Dylan? Seeing then we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to comment on this item? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Commissioners. Mr. Chairman, I highly laud this action and uh, fully support it and make motion as such as requested by staff. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Thank you for your support. Our second public hearing is a miscellaneous budget amendment, number 002. And I believe Kristen is going to present this. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Kristen Daniels, Budget Director. Um, before you today is budget amendment number two. This budget amendment funds the board approved uh, general wage increase. We've reclassified some of the part-time and budgeted temp lifeguard positions, um, as well as the county administrator has made a few changes in some um, staffing, all of which are funded from cash. And uh, per Florida statute 129.062F, whenever the budget is amended using cash, a public hearing must be held. Um, so today, staff recommends that after the public hearing is closed, the board approves their resolution amending the fiscal year 21-22 budget, um, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Kristen. Commissioners, any questions of staff? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to comment on this item? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Commissioner Adams. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to move. Thank you. We have a second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries 5-0. Item 10A3 is another miscellaneous budget amendment, number 003. And once again, Kristen. Thank you. This budget amendment 3 funds the board approved CIE that was approved back in December, as well as any projects and purchase orders that needed to be rolled over from the prior fiscal year into the current fiscal year. Um, again, utilizing cash, which um, <laughs> makes it necessary for us to hold the public hearing. Very good. Is there any questions of staff? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Commissioners? Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to move approval. 
Thank you, Commissioner Adams. And we have a second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. 10A4 is a transmittal hearing of a county initiated request to amend the text of the county's comprehensive plan to add a new chapter 13 property rights element. And that's legislative. And Phil or John, you're gonna kick it off? Kick or it Phil off. kicks it off, okay. Community Development Director and uh, good morning commissioners. I'd like to introduce John Stoll. He is our uh, long range section chief. And this is a state mandated amendment to all the comprehensive plans, city and county uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, John will take you through both the process of amending a comprehensive plan and what the contents of this new element are. And uh, I'll just preface it by saying, since we already complied with what the intent was of this uh, state legislative initiative, it was fairly simple for us to, to adopt this. Go ahead, John. Good morning. Thank you for the inter in introduction there, Phil. Um, so I'm going to do a brief presentation um, on the comprehensive plan amendment process. Uh, so first we have an application submitted to the Community Development Department. Next is a public hearing before the Planning and Zoning Commission. That took place on December 9th. Uh, today we have a transmittal public hearing before the Board of County Commissioners. Next, uh, assuming the, the Commission approves it, we will transmit the application to state and regional review agencies. The state and regional review agencies will send their comments back to us, and then the Board of County Commissioners will hold a final public hearing, and then the adopted amendment is transmitted to state and regional review agencies and the state land planning agency. So the purpose of the request today is a county initiated request to amend the text of the county's comprehensive plan to create a new chapter 13 property rights element, including goals, policies, and objectives. A little background, um, effective July 1st, uh, due to House Bill 59, um, uh, Florida Statute 163-6177 requires all local governments to have a property rights element included in their comprehensive plan. This also limits the, our ability to adopt any other comprehensive plan amendments initiated after July 1st until the adoption of the property rights element. This is Chapter 163-3177 of Florida Statutes. These are the recommended language. I just want to show you these as a comparison to what we are going to propose today. Um, you'll see one through four here, the rights of a property owner to physically possess and control his or her interests in the property, including easements, leases, or mineral rights. The right of a property owner to use, maintain, develop, and improve his or her property for personal use or for the use of any other person subject to state law and local ordinances. The right of the property owner to privacy and to exclude others from the property to protect the owner's possessions and property and the right of a property owner to dispose of his or her property through sale or gift. <clears throat> this is what we are proposing, Chapter 13, Property Rights Element, Goals, Objectives, and Policies. The property rights element goal, Indian River County shall make decisions with respect for property rights and with respect for people's rights to participate in decisions that affect their lives and property. Objective 1, Consideration of Property Rights. Indian River County shall respect judicially acknowledged and constitutionally protected private property rights. Um, policy 1.1, and these are exactly mirrored in the Florida statute. The county shall consider in its decision making the right of a property owner to physically possess and control his or her interest in the property, including easements, leases, or mineral rights. Um, unless you want me to read those all, I think you've seen them. I think we've got them. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so in order for us to adopt a uh, comprehensive plan amendment, uh, we have to be consistent with policy 14.3. And one of the four criteria below have to be met, a mistake in the approved plan, an oversight in the approved plan, a substantial change in circumstances, or a swap or reconfiguration of land uses at separate sites. Today we have a substantial change in circumstances due to the state requiring that the county adopt a property rights element into the comprehensive plan. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended unanimously that the BCC approve the proposed comprehensive plan text amendment for transmittal to state and regional review agencies. And staff and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners approve the proposed conference of plan text amendment for transmittal to state and re regional review agencies. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Commissioners, any questions of staff? Seeing none, we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak on this matter? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Commissioners? Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to move approval. I'll second. We have a motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Moss. All in favor signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. And we come to our final public hearing of the day, 10A5. 
consideration of a land development regulation amendments to sections 901.03 and 911.06, allowing solar facilities as a permitted use in all agricultural zoning districts. This is legislative in nature, and Mr. Sweeney is going to present here. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, uh, Ryan Sweeney, Chief of Current Development with the County Community Development Department. Uh, similar to what we just saw with the property rights element, this is another state legislative driven item, um, essentially mandating through SB 896 and now Florida Statute 163.3205 that sol solar facilities be uh, treated as a permitted use in all agricultural zoning districts in the unincorporated portion of the county. Um, so that's what exactly what staff did. And um, for what it's worth, we've had, I believe, three approved and built. A fourth one's approved and under construction. And, and I, I believe FPL is looking at coming in and doing a fifth site for solar facilities, all west of 95, generally in the A2 zoning district. But this does allow it in all three of our ag districts. And uh, they've been, by and large, well received. We haven't really received any complaints. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended uh, approval unanimously at the December 9th meeting. And the only uh, sort of oddity to this one is that for the second hearing, because this is changing the list of permitted uses in the ordinance, um, the state statute recommends that the second hearing be held at 5.01 p.m. or after 5 p.m or if the board through four, four or five uh, board members decide to vote to hold it at a regular meeting, we can just hold it at the regular uh, February 1 at 9 a.m. And that's typically been the practice. So that's what staff's recommendation is to, if there's any changes needed, which there's not much to this ordinance, uh, to hold the second hearing at uh, 9 a.m. on February 1. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Ryan, the only question I have in the statute, does it define what a solar facility is? Yeah, in the, yes, it does. And so we add in our section a definition of solar facilities. It's, it's cut and paste. It's okay. pretty straightforward. So in the future, you know, who knows, 20 years from now, they might build some 400-foot-high solar thing, and I, that's not we're correct. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I, right. We're basically accounting for what we're seeing right now. Right. Okay, perfect. Um, with that, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this matter? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Commissioners. Mr. Chairman, being that all the solar fields are in District 3 at this time, and it seems to be going pretty well, I'll move staff recommendation. Second. I'll second. And is that a recommendation to have the second meeting at our regularly scheduled 9 o'clock meeting? Is that part of the motion? Absolutely. And part of the, the second, Commissioner Flesher? Yeah. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Ehrman, second by Commissioner Flesher. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, and we'll be back. Okay. Um, commissioners, before we dig into the health clinic thing, um, if you all don't mind, we um, added an item that I uh, had moved to 12E, the multi-factor auth authentication software. Uh, Dan, IT director, if you could just give us three words on this, I think we can move this on. Dan Russell, Information Technology Director. I uh, apologize for the late add on this one. We had some delays collecting the required quotes due to COVID outages. Uh, so that's why we're late making it to the agenda. Uh, briefly, we uh, purchased the, as is indicated in the staff report, we purchased the MFA software last year uh, to meet compliance requirements for our cybersecurity liability insurance. Uh, this is just a request to renew that same package uh, again this year uh, for one additional year. Uh, we're seeing a minor increase in cost, sub $100 increase overall. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions of staff? Move staff recommendation. Thank you. We have a, I'll go ahead and second the motion. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by myself. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 5 0. Thank you, Dan. Um, with that, we will now go to uh, Human Resources 12D. Results of consultant findings, phase one, employer health clinic wellness center. And we'll let Suzanne kick this off. Good morning. Good morning, Suzanne Boyle, human resources director, Indian River County. And uh, we're just gonna be reviewing the staff report that uh, was provided as part of the agenda today. And I have Jacqueline LaDuca with Lockton Companies. And we also have Melissa Ancio, who is a subject matter expert related to employee health clinics uh, with Lockton, who is available for call-in, 
would you prefer that she call in now and be available or do you want to do that later um why don't we have her call in once you make your presentation and then will we have any discussion thank you okay so as you all know back in may we uh took a matter before the board related to the employer health clinic and the board directed staff to engage locked in companies to conduct a uh, clinic feasibility assessment and claims analysis related to uh, the possibility of an employer clinic. So Lockton has done that. And uh, some of the data that we uh, reviewed included uh, claims activity from January 2019 through December 2020 incurred. So it was a two year time frame that they looked at. Um, they uh, have baseline data that they compared it to the norms as we speak about in, in the findings, which are based on the InfoLock book of business uh, that Lockton has, which consists of 2.3 million lives. So there's a lot of data that we're benchmarking against. And uh, the report itself was quite exhaustive, but we just took key parts of it and included it in the staff report. Uh, the first is on page two. Uh, you'll see where we have some key elements. Some of the things that were looked at were the demographics, cost, utilization risk and conditions of our of our group you know we have 3600 lives within our group but what they really keyed in on um, are the uh, the reti the employees retirees and spouses um, not so much the children because that really wouldn't be relevant to an employer clinic so what we found out was in our demographic group uh, we did kind of know this but our um, we're an older group our average age is 38, and the book of business is running at 34. Um, our total paid per member per month is pretty much in line with the book of business, so our plan is doing well. Um, and it's interesting to note <coughs> that the per member per month spend for a spouse is higher than what it costs for an employee. To, so to ensure the spouse, they're bringing in uh, the per member per month average cost is $592, and employees are running at 511 uh, a month. We have a high percentage of membership that's using our medical plan, which is great because that means that people are getting care that they need uh, through physician services. So that's running about 84%. Um, we did notice that we have increased urgent care and emergency room utilization. I think we spoke about this previously, how um, our membership uses urgent care and uh, emergency room. And uh, some of those uh, events are primary care treatable or non-emergent especially among our employee group. So we have folks that are using urgent care and emergency room uh, visits when really another uh, less costly uh, uh, type of care could be sought. Um, we're finding that our most treated conditions are hypertension, hyperlipidemia, which is um, cholesterol, uh, muscular skeletal, and those types of things could all be treated in a clinic setting. And we're finding that 72% of our ER visits are occurring Monday through Friday, which is during a time frame that an employer type clinic could be established. Uh, we do have a high percentage of members that have what's, what we term as three plus chronic conditions. 70% uh, of our members have three or more chronic conditions, which represents 45% of our total plan spend. So 45% of what the health plan is spending on care is uh, related to 17% of our members that have three or more chronic conditions. And um, Indian River County is expected to use 31% more healthcare resources than the locked in book of business based on our population risk. So the age, the fact that we have a lot of spouses, the fact that we um, have our members that have three or more chronic conditions, there, we're expecting higher utilization, 31% uh, more than what the locked in book of business is. And uh, employees, we're finding that our employees have conditions that can be most impacted with interventions that might result in improved outcomes. So you catch it early, you might prevent it from becoming that thing that uh, could, could be very um, uh, catastrophic for somebody or very expensive to the plan. Um, we are also finding that out of the conditions that our, our members have, 7% uh, uh, diabetes, prediabetes at 7%, muscular skeletal disorders, the 43%, 
those are the most uh, conditions that are more prevalent, and they're more prevalent than the book of business with locked in. So that's that's kind of just a, a review of what our group is looking like. <coughs> um, then we drop down into uh, demographics and cost. You can kind of see uh, we we did not include the children here. It's just the spouses and the employees, and you can see that we've got 1,690 employees. That does include retirees, by the way, because we don't distinguish them separately. Um, but the 1,690 subscribers, we'll call them, out of a total population of 3,690 with 811 spouses. And you can kind of see where our age is. You can see the total amount allowed for the cost. So 8.5 million is going to employees, 4. Point almost 6 million to spouses. Um, the total population, we're at 23.4 million. Um, you see the paid uh, per member per month breakout of those costs um, and that the spouses are pretty high there. The, the medical component and the pharmacy component broken out by our total population, the employees and the spouses. So you can kind of see how the spend is going in that regard. Now those are some high level numbers and you're like, what does this have to do with a clinic? Well. The aging population suggests that there's a need for preventive care and condition management, and those are services that a wellness center could offer. Um, the total per member per month is in line with the norm, so it's not that we're really spending a lot more than other health plans, you know, that our group is, is doing well. Our plan is actually uh, right on budget, so, so that's good news. Uh, we do have employees that have conditions that could be impacted with interventions that would result in improved outcomes like I spoke about earlier. And um, there's an opportunity for a cost shifting strategy by phasing spouses into clinic eligibility over a multi-year period that would divert care from the community to the clinic. That's a possibility that exists because our spouses are our, um, the per member per month fee is a little bit high and they do have utilization that could be offered in a clinic setting. But then we talk into utilization and we, we look at, okay, what's, what are we kind of seeing with our group? Well, we talked about member claim activity, 84%. This is a really good number because that means that our people are seeing the, the doctors and they are getting uh, care. Uh, we do see ER visits are higher than the book of business. The book of business is averaging 212, and we're at 226 ER visits per 1,000, so that's kind of high. Uh, we are seeing that uh, the emergent or primary care treatable, where people might be going, 64% of them could probably be done in a different setting than in the emergent care or urgent care setting. We're seeing that our urgent care visits are quite high, uh, 361 urgent care visits compared with the book of business of 181. Uh, we are seeing strong uh, utilization on our telemedicine visits, which really wouldn't have any, any impact here in a clinic setting. Uh, we're seeing really high uh, office visit utilization, which is good. You've got your specialist, your primary care, and uh, we actually have a really strong preventive care visits for our group, so that's good. People are connected uh, with, with primary care. And then the uh, prescription numbers um, uh, were higher than the book of business on the prescriptions. You can kind of see over on the far right the, the, farm, uh, the uh, number for spouses uh, for prescription medications is quite high. But again, these are just numbers. The, the details of the costs um, uh, aren't really stated here, but this is just utilization. So what do, what do we kind of see from this? Well, we have favorable claim activity across our total population. We have great utilization of office and specialist visits, preventive visits, and telemedicine visits, so that's great. Um, utilization patterns suggest that we might have favorable engagement in a wellness center. So people are going to the, their primary care, they're going to urgent care, they're, they're getting care in the ER settings, uh, which may be uh, care that they could be uh, diverted to a wellness center. By place of service, our ER visits are higher than the norm and a higher percentage of potentially non-emergent and primary care treatable uh, type care is being given. And so um, there, there could be a, an opportunity of offering a no or low cost or convenient care in a wellness center that might help divert those potentially non-emergent or primarily, uh, primary care treatable visits. 
So again, this is all an analysis of data for over a two-year period. It's a picture in time of what happened and maybe what could have happened if we were to offer a wellness center, a uh, health center. And then um, urgent care is, we're in surplus of the norm, especially among spouses. So uh, there could be an opportunity to redirect uh, uh, this urgent care to a wellness center. So that's kind of a little bit of what we've experienced over the past two years and, and does it make, you know, would it make sense? Would there be an opportunity to divert care to a wellness center? And uh, the answer is, is there is an opportunity there. Um, you can kind of see a breakdown of our ER visits by day of the week. So 72% of our ER visits are happening uh, during the week and 27.2% uh, during the weekend. Uh, again, the urgent care, you can kind of see the breakdown there. You'll see a lot of urgent care visits are on a Monday. Um, some of them are on the weekends, but a good number of the urgent care visits just happen Monday through Friday. And you can see that our employees, that's the, the on page four, 402 uh, using these urgent care visits uh, during the week. So as far as risk and conditions, we spoke earlier about members with three or more conditions, that's 17%. Um, that's higher than the book of business. So uh, we do have an opportunity to perhaps uh, make some intervention uh, there through a wellness center. And you can kind of see the breakdown uh, between employees and spouses. We have a strong opportunity with our employee group uh, with 420 members um, uh, in this, uh, this three or more chronic conditions. You can see members with three or more conditions in the percent paid. So um, you'll see 45% of, of what's being uh, paid out of the plan for managing these conditions. is That's a pretty high number when you look back at that 23 million total that we had. And um, let's drop down into the conditions. Again, the breakdown of the prediabetes, the diabetes, and the musculoskeletal, uh, which are all things that potentially could be impacted through a clinic. So um, we have a unfavorable high illness burden uh, compared to the norm, and uh, we have an opportunity that a wellness center could offer access to care and serve as a hub, serve as a hub for engaging members in condition management, including with our Connect Diabetes Management Program. So there is an opportunity there. Um, our spouses present the highest risk, although the employees are the most impactable. So what's interesting is even though the spouses are the highest risk, the, the, the opportunity exists most with the employees to make some impact uh, through perhaps a wellness center or an employee clinic. And then um, there's also an opportunity where uh, we could have employees benefit from interventions, including the programs offered within a wellness care setting. So different than going to an urgent care facility or the ER to receive treatment, a wellness center, you're kind of focused a little bit more on relationship and being known and having someone who has access to your benefit plan and, and what might be available and kind of connecting people to uh, early intervention. So that's, that's some opportunity that exists there. So we talked about all that. We talked about our conditions. We talked about what opportunities might be there for our membership to be served in uh, a health clinic uh, wellness center setting. But then we need to talk about, okay, what's the feasibility assessment and findings related to cost? So what does this look like? So I know when we uh, talked about this in the past, we talked about um, some guiding principles that were important to us, and I'll, I'll kind of go back to that. We, we spoke about a clinic as uh, being an added benefit to attract and retain employees. Uh, we uh, talked about care being available at no or low cost to offset the member impact of uh, premium increases and the plan design changes that were kind of happening over the years. Uh, we talked about it would be good that care would be convenient and easily accessible for members to get to. And then we also talked about the clinic should be financially sound, producing plan savings over time. And that's where we then get to page five where we talk about the numbers. So um, we actually spent some time diving into the claims analysis and Lockton uh, identified that there's potentially uh, $962,000 worth of divertible claims in that period of time that we reviewed that potentially could be diverted to a clinic setting. <clears throat> But I don't want that number to be stuck in your head of, you know, the $962,000 because the reality is that some people won't 
ever use the clinic for, for care. They, they, they would choose not to. And we kind of saw that when we went back to that survey that we took. The board had asked us to survey our employees and the percentage of employees that, that said that they would like to uh, see a clinic or they'd like to use a clinic. But there was a portion of our employees, you know, 30 some percent that said, I never would. Um, and then you have, you know, maybe the roughly 60 something, 70 percent that said, yeah, they'd consider it. You know, and some, some, some of them might have strongly considered it, others might, well, you know, I kind of like to have to see it to see whether or not that would be a place that I would go for my care. So when we look at that, Lockton, uh, is not going to uh, tell you a number that it's like, oh yeah, you know, you're going to get $962,000 of savings if you build this clinic. That's not it at all. They come in with a very conservative, what they call a low diversion uh, strategy for a year one of a clinic. And they're, you know, 20 to 30% is what they're looking at. And that number is more in line with a uh, little over $200,000 of potentially divertible claims. So that's where you would look to say, uh, could we say that we diverted that from the client, you know, that, that money would have been spent on claims and now it's going to be delivered through a clinic setting. Potentially, yes. And it could be more or it could be less. It just depends on how comfortable people feel about going to the employee clinic. So a lot of that would have to do with how did you roll, how would you roll something like that out and uh, making sure that people had the assurances that they needed, that it was confidential, that they, they had good confidence in the care provider that was in the clinic. Um, and those types of things. So um, the types of uh, visits that would be uh, diverted into a clinic setting, the chronic condition management, which is, remember that 17% that we talked about that have three or more chronic conditions. Um, those are the folks that we would hope would engage with a clinic setting that we could help influence some better outcomes. Uh, immunizations and labs, office visits for medical care and preventive care. Those are the types of things that you would be looking at uh, providing and offering in a clinic setting. Um, so it's difficult to actually project an actual savings that may be realized by implementing a health, a health clinic or a wellness center because again, every year is different. Everybody's uh, experience is a little bit different. You don't know when you're going to catch an upper respiratory infection, you don't know when you're going to have this pain that you just kind of wanted somebody to check out or talk to somebody about. So that type of utilization, it's going to vary year by year depending upon uh, the medical uh, situations that come up for our members. But beyond just the diversion savings that we talked about, there are some other potential uh, benefits of having an employer health clinic and wellness center. Um, we could have it set up to where we aligned and integrated with our other benefits. So different than um, going to uh, a non-employer clinic setting, um, those places don't know what we offer. They don't know our health plan. They don't know our chronic condition management programs. They don't know about Connect. They don't know about uh, our pharmacy benefit program, Canna RX. They don't know about Surgery Plus. So an employer clinic could kind of help uh, guide our members to those types of things and better get them connect, you know, get them better connected to those types of resources with our plan specific to us. Um, another big piece of it is referring for appropriate follow-up testing and care to in-network providers without any conflict of interest. What I mean by this is um, when you have a clinic that's independent, that is your employer clinic and it's not really connected to other um, providers in the community, they have, they're, 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 they have no conflict of interest, no business relationships to route and refer people for care to different things. They can step back and truly just do a referral that's appropriate for the appropriate follow-up care and, and, and care and testing to our in-network providers under the plan and maybe with an emphasis on, hey, we know that this place does a good job and they're very economical, right? as far as the way that the plan pays out. Um, another potential benefit would be uh, reduced time away from work due to a near or on-site access to an efficient run clinic setting. So we've all kind of been there where you, you know, take the morning off, you think you're gonna be gone two hours and it becomes something more because you're waiting for a while to, to be seen um, or you have to take the afternoon off. So having a near or on-site uh, clinic could be uh, much more efficient for our employees and their time away from work. 
Um, there is also a possibility for first site of treatment for workplace injuries. So I, I wouldn't envision any you know, a full occupational health, but it could be, you know, if somebody gets cut, they go to the clinic and it's, it's triage there. And if they don't need to go anywhere else, that's fine. Get, get them patched up back to work, uh, something very simple. Um, the prescription savings. So uh, there could be an opportunity uh, if there were some uh, low-cost medications that were delivered through a clinic setting as opposed to the expensive brand names that, you know, somebody might write and say, here, go get this, and there's actually this more uh, economical uh, version of medication that a prescription could be given. Um, the other opportunity could be improved communication with medical provider and coordination of care. So uh, members feeling, you know, having a point of contact that they could come to to kind of help with coordinating their medical care and, and uh, just talking with someone about maybe they had to have a surgery and they wanted to just get a little bit of advice in a clinic setting, uh, know a little bit more information about this, this condition that they might be trying to manage. Uh, we would expect increased compliance with management of chronic conditions. And uh, one thing, which is you can't really quantify this, but you would look at avoidance of high cost claims over time due to improved management of chronic conditions. So I kind of think of, you know, you have somebody who's three or more chronic conditions and maybe the cost is going to be like this, but maybe we're able to influence to where it's more like this rather than being big, you know, due to, to not having care. So. Um, along those lines, when we start looking at an employer clinic, uh, we did ask Lockton for some recommendations on uh, what type of a model, staffing, eligibility, cost share would, would make sense. Um, one of the very important things related to an employer clinic is if you choose to, um, to do this, you wanted to make sure it's the right size. You don't want to spend more money than you need to. Uh, you want to make it the right size to be able to deliver the services that you would be looking for. So uh, locked in is uh, using the principles of cost effective to align with the services that are recommended based on that cl claims population review that I spoke about. Um, they would uh, recommend uh, a clinic model focusing on preventive care, episodic care, labs and condition management with uh, potentially a limited pharmacy benefit. Uh, and limited occupational health. That's that first aid and referral to a workers' comp network uh, doctor when needed. They would look at staffing with a mid-level clinician. So this would be a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant and a medical office assistant. They would uh, recommend that eligibility be uh, open to employees and retirees on the first year and then spouses added at a future time if it was determined to be financially advisable. Um, the reason you do that, you would limit it to the, even though your, your spouses were kind of costly, um, to staff to be able to meet employee and spouses, you would have to increase your staffing beyond a mid-level clinician. So um, you, you just want to make sure you're getting good utilization year one, that it, it's, it's, it's got the ground that it needs, and then you look at year two, uh, perhaps rolling in your spouses. And then uh, from the cost share perspective, um, uh, the recommendation would be no member co-pay or cost share for services, at least in the first year, uh, maybe beyond that, depending upon how things worked out. And uh, let's see, what else do I have here? Okay, so that's what they would recommend. When you start looking at, um, if, if we chose to do this, this health clinic wellness center would be an increased benefit to the workforce and it, it would be a complement to the health plan. Uh, it, would, it would be independent of the health plan, so it would not run under claims. We wouldn't submit claims uh, through Florida Blue. It would, be, uh, it would need to be funded uh, separately from our health plan. And um, any of the benefits that were offered beyond uh, just simple wellness, uh, you just need to know that these are considered what's termed a significant benefit under the IRS guidelines. So um, uh, what that means is if at some point in the, in the future Indian River County ever uh, wanted to offer a high deductible health plan, members that were enrolled under a high deductible health plan could not have free access to the clinic because it would be, um, it would uh, uh, conflict with a high deductible health plan. High deductible health plans, you actually have to meet your deductible first 
uh, and all of your um, care needs to be out of pocket first before you start having plan coverage, significant plan coverage. So um, that would just mean that we would have to put a little price tag on the clinic visit for anyone who was enrolled in a high deductible health plan. That's not our today. That's just as we look down the road if that was ever a, a, a plan that we wanted to offer. So uh, we've talked about what would a clinic do, what should it look like, who could we serve, what type of services could we have, and now we need to talk about what cost would be. Cost for a clinic could range uh, anywhere startup costs, 100, 150,000. Uh, those costs include technology, uh, implementation, supplies and equipment, uh, the clinic wellness center space and build out, and um, then depending upon where we uh, identified that it would make sense to have a clinic, you know, that the cost could go up uh, from there if any real estate needed to be procured if we did not use existing real estate that we already owned. Now, that's startup costs. <coughs> then you look at uh, estimated annual recurring costs. Lockton's uh, estimate is uh, six to seven hundred thousand dollars. They get this based on other clinics' startup costs of a similar um, type of a setup as what we would we would have. Um, those types of ongoing recurring costs um, include an administrative fee that's paid to a clinic vendor, which is usually done as either a flat fee or a subscriber fee. They either do it per employee per month or per employee per year. So you you know. Uh, have to pay your clinic vendor. Um, you have pass-through costs of supplies, labs, medication, dispensing, those types of things. There's a fee for technology and the electronic medical record. And then um, if you ever expanded your clinic wellness services, that could increase costs. So anytime you add on a service, um, uh, like if you wanted to do some type of diagnostic testing or an x-ray, I think we had talked about an x-ray at one time, you know, putting an x-ray machine in, it costs something, and then you have to have someone who has that certification who can take the x-rays, and then you have to then have someone who reads the x-rays. So those are all increased costs that could happen related to that. So um, uh, following, uh, the, if we were to choose to go down the path of a clinic, um, after we went through a request for proposal process and after a clinic vendor was selected, the implementation process would involve uh, some support from county staff, which would include uh, human resources, public works, information technology, budget and purchasing, so it is a project. And uh, the funding, of course, we'd have to fund for it, so um, it would be paid out of the health insurance fund. And those first year costs would be expected to be seven hundred to eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and those funds would need to be allocated at a future budget amendment, utilizing the health insurance fund cash uh, forward as of October first. And so then, uh, with that, um, I would uh, entertain any questions that you have. And uh, Suzanne, this might be a good time to have your call in person okay. if there are ever we contact them to have them call in. Absolutely. Um, Commissioners, any questions of staff? Commissioner Flesher? Uh, Joe? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Suzanne, what, what is the uh, anticipated response from uh, our insurance providers in having this as far as a reduction or possible reduction in those ER visits and uh, that would be taken into consideration, obviously, but uh, have we explored the, the impact? Yeah, and that's kind of in that first year, that diversion that we talked about, the $200,000, that's a 20 to 30% that's diversion. It included urgent care, ER visits, uh, just regular doctor's visits, um, labs. That was a percentage of diversion um, that we estimated, and that was a low diversion estimate. So... Um, on the low end, that mm -hmm. 200000 Could be higher. Could be higher. And uh, so our cost factor... Good morning, Board of County Commissioners. The, the cost factor to, to the county for the service from the insurance providers, that's the number? So I'm sorry, say that again, please. The cost factor to the county for the insurance provision yes that's the number yes those that, were direct claims costs that's that the direct went claims the cost plan. is 
seems a little low, but. Well, the total number was 962,000 for the types of visits within, remember, we're looking at, um, we did a 10 mile, was it a 10 mile radius? I think it was a 10 mile radius of 32960 that you could expect to divert folks. So it would be the people that are living within that 10 mile radius of 32960 that had those types of visits that you would expect that come. Now, keep in mind, we do have a segment of our, of our insured group that live outside of that 10 mile radius, people who drive in uh, from South Florida, a little bit to the west, a little bit to the north that come to work at Indian River County and may not actually live within that. So it's, it's possible that you could have some diversion from those places, but what they tend to find is when people are seeking uh, urgent care uh, or even emergent care, they're going within usually 10 miles of where they live to get it. I, I guess there's no uh, numerical value, no cost factor that we can attach to. Uh, once again, you can identify that uh, any ER visit is going to have layered costs depending upon what the expertise uh, that has to be applied for that given patient. But uh, more importantly is it's when that ER visit occurs, no matter what ER it is, I'm not identifying any one given sure. emergency room, um, if, if, it, and things generally happen as, as a parent and great citizen of this county, uh, things happen around six o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday and that, that ER visit can be four and five hours before we get to the, the care that's needed. So I think there's no cost factor that we can associate those four or five hours that the individual is sitting there. Those, those are some really good points. The lost time, the, the time that somebody spends waiting to be seen. Uh, it is important to know though that for this clinic, we would be looking at a Monday through Friday during a typical um, uh, office day. You know, it, maybe it's eight to five, Monday through Friday. The, the, um, the labor resources to staff into the evening hours and onto the weekend, that would increase your implementation costs for a clinic and your, your, um, your fee. So Lockton's not recommending that we run expanded hours on a clinic, uh, on an employer clinic. It would be more of a Monday through Friday. You could have some days where maybe you slid the day into where some evening, you know, you kind of look at it and say, makes sense to maybe on a Wednesday to have later hours Seven. than normal. Yeah. It just depends. Um, understand that we would be actually paying a, a clinic vendor to uh, staff it with, with a, a physician uh, assistant or a nurse practitioner. So that person would be, um, uh, usually it's, it's, it's one provider that we could establish relationship with. And uh, for, for that, they would probably be looking for a, a job uh, that had hours that worked for them as well as worked for us. So you want to make sure you get the right coverage over the right times. So there could be a high cost for convenience and... Uh, you, yeah, you have to just pick the right balance. You're not going to be able to be all things to all people. So you want to be the right things to the right people during the right times if you're offering in an employer clinic. And then another thing that I wanted to touch base on related to the emergency room care... What they did was, and you're right, the number seems low. Yeah. They actually looked at the emergency care visits that they looked like they were non-emergent. They, they really didn't need to be seen in an emergency room. They weren't a true, you know, like I'm, I'm having heart palpitations or I'm having, you know, something going on that is emergent and I need emergency room care. <coughs> Elevated been, fever. Yes, something exactly. That, that, so yeah. out of the whole total emergency room cost, you have a segment of that that could have been diverted based on the yeah. two, uh, two uh, so that's where that number kind of came in uh, overall it being the, the $202,000 of the total 962,000 total divertible costs. They're saying low diversion, 20 to 30%. Does that make sense when I say that? Okay. Thank you for the okay. clarification. Vice sure. Chairman Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Following back on what um, Commissioner Fleischer just added, you would base your hours on your demand probably too. Exactly. It would be based on, on your demand. Yes. Good. And we have some, some visual <coughs> illustration. You kind of saw the urgent care. You saw Mondays. Mondays were a big day for urgent care. So obviously you'd want to be open on a Monday. <clears throat> would we
we use the county plan on using this clinic to, for workman's comp issues that are non-emergent? Mm. So um, Jason and I have had some conversations about this and, and for an employer clinic from a health center and a wellness center, I think what would make sense is that initial care that somebody could go to the clinic and get assessed and then route it into the workers' comp uh, network if needed. But if it was care that could be delivered and it, and it made sense to do so in the clinic setting, like a couple of stitches or something like that and get bandaged up and go on, you don't have to go any further. But for true uh, uh, workers' comp case management, that would be outside of the clinic. Okay. Hmm. I mean, because the goal is here, let's get people back to work. As well. Exactly. And most, most employees do want to get back to work. For right. Them. Drug testing, what about drug testing? I would not envision this being a place for drug testing mm -hmm. because that's that's kind of a separate, you have to go through certain uh, certifications to be a lab that falls under that. Um, it just doesn't make sense to me to do that. And then there can be a negative connotation with the drug testing and I think it would work against the whole, that's yeah. That's yeah. I was just gonna ask, right. Entry level physicals, say for new firefighters, sheriffs, deputies, things like that, entry level physicals. You know, it, it would just depend on the nature of the physical and what type of uh, subject matter expert you would need. The minimum required by the state in every, in every. We could look at that, but we wouldn't want to take away the opportunity to service the members on the chronic conditions and the wellness and those types of things. So it really would depend on what your volume would be and whether that would take up slots that you could be potentially impacting your, your uh, diversion. So what I mean by that is those costs don't go to our health plan today for the uh, doctor's visits, you know, the, the, um, the physicals and things like that. It's kind of a separate uh, uh, account that it's paid out of for those kind of physicals. So if the intent is to open up this clinic to the insured members and potentially divert cost from the health plan to a, to a, a more savings in the in a clinic setting and to uh, help people manage their chronic conditions to keep those costs down. I don't know that the uh, employer physicals would be the place that you'd want them to sit in the clinic. It just depends. We, you could potentially do it, but I don't know if it would be. I would think it's something you need to look at. You start you started by that. To me, you started you starting a wellness program right there with that. Right. Normally, the physicals required by the state are, are minimal. Right. You know, uh, it's not like you have to, you know, do X-rays. You may have to do EKG, mm -hmm. blood testing, things like that. But that's mm -hmm. they're minimal. But I, I mean, my idea in this also is to not only to have a wellness center for mm -hmm. people and have the relationships with which, which you want to get. It's also to just just to save us money, no matter whether we're doing it on the end or we're doing it sure. on, the, on the beginning. In some way. So it's I mean, certainly so something that could be. My question is, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking at those things, some of these type things that, that we that we send out of, you know, basically doing them in-house, let's call it. for. Right, and if it made sense to do so and didn't work against us on the other goals, I think it could certainly be something that we looked at. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to overthink this. I want to mm -hmm. provide. If we're going to do it, I want to make sure we're providing a good product for our employees and something they have confidence in. Right. That. That's what. That's what's important to me because it will never be successful if we don't do it right and they don't have confidence in it. Right. And you know we are that we'd be wasting our time and our money if we, if we can't establish that from from the very beginning. Um, I, I think it's got potential. I think I, you know, I'd like to hear more what. Everybody says up here, or the fellow commissioners, what, what the county administrator says. And uh, that's all I have for now. I'm going to have the questions you. later. Anyone down here? Commissioner Adams? Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner West? Um, yes. Uh, thank you for the information. Um, f it, it appears to me that this is a very high cost experiment for which there is not necessarily a high demand. Um, you know, you can build it, and they cannot come. And uh, I, I just view this as, as too high risk, frankly, uh, financially. That's for, from my perspective. But I do appreciate the information. I'm, I am not in favor of this. Commissioner Adams? Yeah. Um, I appreciate the information. I appreciate you guys going through the process to bring this all back. I know it's been long. Um, 
and we've had multiple conversations on it. I think that, you know, from the perspective of health health care costs and insurance costs, it continues to go up. So we need to start looking at ways to cap it or, um, as you say, divert people into preventative um, areas where some of those higher cost chronic illnesses, we are able to provide other options so we can get to the point of hospitalization or emergency care. What kind of stuck out to me in the presentation was the amount of um, the amount of people that are using urgent care, uh, that that number, that percentage, and um, I don't, I scrolled past the page. So anyway, it was in early, was significantly higher than what the average or what the expectation was should be, and I think that that speaks to one of um, the issues that we need to fa we need to look at addressing from an insurance perspective is how do we get people into wellness type programs or getting them used to regular checkups, going to the doctor on a more regular basis instead of when it is an emergency, mm -hmm. and are they doing that because they don't have a comfortable place to go or they don't have a, a regular practitioner, or is it because of the cost? So if this if a, a clinic is somehow able to help keep those costs down, then I would sincerely believe over time you're going to see those uses of urgent care and those emergency surgeries and those types of things come down. And as I recall from prior conversations, those were really some of the drivers behind our insurance um, rates going up was those larger um, surgeries and those larger um, chronic illnesses that needed uh, specific medication and medication that you would then have to take over time forever and ever. Um, not to say that seeing a doctor regularly prevents all of that, but it certainly helps um, create an atmosphere of wellness and health and healthy living that helps prevent um, some of these issues later in life. So. For me, I think that there are some um, positive notes in what you've brought to us. I think with any decision that we make, there's going to be drawbacks and there's going to be an, uh, an element of the unknown. Is it going to save us money? Is it not going to save us money? You know, we don't really know until we, we get in and, and see what um, our, an RFP might bring our way. But I do know that if we don't do anything, then the numbers are going to, the cost is, continue, is going to continue to go up and we're just going to kind of sit here and wring our hands without any options. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, Mr. Chair, but if we did put something out for an RFP, it doesn't necessarily mean that we would have to accept it. I'll defer to uh, Dylan, but I believe a, we, a proposal is different than a request for a bid. Yeah, I mean, you could re reject all bids. I mean, we could you know, the board could be dissatisfied with what the costs are, or, you know, you know, the proposals that came in. So we could put something out for an RFP and see what comes back. And if it's not something that we think at that point is, is viable, mm -hmm. we could decide not to move forward. Yeah. I mean, I think generally the intent, if you're doing an RFP is that right. you're, that you're planning to move forward with something, but it can certainly happen that you, what we get does not satisfy what what we think would be the need. So let's say you know the the estimated cost was six or seven hundred thousand a year ongoing. If if we got one proposal and it was for two million dollars a year, well that's a completely different scenario, and and we don't have to award to anyone just because we move move forward with a, with an RFP. So my preference would be to move forward with an RFP and see what we come back with. My I mean at this point I think it is something that we need to continue to explore. I understand that there is, um, we're just not sure, so I, I can't speak for my other commissioners, but I do feel, and in my experience and what I've talked with other organizations and agencies that have kind of gone this route is over time, <coughs> the savings, as people get used to using the clinic, the savings starts adding up. Um, you're not going to see a, maybe a huge cost savings in year one, but you know, for me, year one to year three, as long as we're not losing money, we're building a base and we're building a routine that then people will start utilizing more and more. And as we can get some of those spouses on board, because again, as your um, uh, memo reflected, a lot of the cost is, is born through that that spouse or a spousal aspect as well. So 
that is my not short two six two <laughs> cents. Maybe it's like seventeen cents, but anyway, those are my that's my input. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Um, no, Commissioner Fletcher. I, I totally concur. Um, again, in some jurisdictions, uh, clinics have been developed. They have failed. And in some jurisdictions, clinics are the way to go for the employees. It's as simple as that. I think it depends upon patient load, patient confidence, and availability as well as marketing. And uh, again, uh, Commissioner Airman brought up, uh, you know, on the testing thing. Yeah, that would be a, a, a big no. Uh, that would not build confidence. That would be, not build a relationship. And as, as far as uh, looking at uh, any uh, liabilities, maybe that could be the first step and then referred to a, uh, another practitioner for comp. I, I understand that. But I think day to day, this could be a tremendous benefit in the long run, and it could be a cost reduction, and it could greatly assist this, the people who really count. That's the employees, the employees and their families. And uh, I, I think uh, probably about seven years ago, uh, a concept was um, proposed uh, by a, a certain doctor in, in the area and he wanted to open up his own clinic and be authorized. And, and it was another doctor friend of mine that talked me through truly understanding what was about to be proposed. And uh, we didn't go in that direction. And there was different economic times, different medical times. I mean, can you, you just imagine if what we've gone through uh, through these past few years of COVID challenge, if we had a clinic that the employees can go to, that maybe productivity and day-to-day uh, -day operations uh, would, would might be better uh, if it had not been from some of the ch hurdles that had to be overcome. As far as the children, children being out of school, uh, for such a long period of time. Uh, th there were many factors where I believe that a clinic probably would have been monumentally beneficial. And I think the numbers and the cost factor uh, would have been offset. Uh, hopefully that's behind us. I don't know, you don't know, nobody here has got a crystal ball. But if we're confronted with su such an event to have an employee clinic, I, I th think can be a tremendous value. Um, you know, folks, remember, there were times where all emergency rooms said, don't come here. You can't come here. And then if you came there and if you had uh, certain symptoms, you could not be with the patient. Now you're separating a family member with the provider or the person who has the insurance and the parent. And a lot of that was happening and it really tore us apart. It really tore the structure apart. So again, if we had something like that, I'm not working on the emotions, I'm just working on facts that we might have been better served if we had a clinic that was able to have intake and that non-separation and on all of that take place, uh, we might have flowed a little easier. I think we did pretty well, but we could have done even better. So there are some other undiscussed benefits that are underlying, plus the fact it's another benefit to the employee that makes them want to go. There are clinics elsewhere, and I'd like to see uh, more of that research as to what that big drawer is, but I truly believe in a clinical operation. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Flesher. Um, <clears throat> Suzanne, a slightly off topic here, but I did have the opportunity to utilize one of our newer benefits of Surgery Plus. Um, I needed a minor surgery that fell under their categories and just wanna say that um, that experience went very well. Um, the surgery was in early December and 
I have yet to see a bill from anything related to it. Uh, so uh, it, that, I think that was a very positive uh, uh, um, experience. I also utilized the telemed, and that's what I wanted to really talk about, because you mentioned the telemed benefit won't really impact our clinic. So I had a, basically what was like a, a swimmer's ear that I just couldn't clear up. And I thought, okay, I'm pretty sure it's just an infection, and what I need is an antibiotic. So under our current system, I had the option of going to a walk-in clinic, which I, I would. You know, I wouldn't go to ER, but I'd go to walk-in and pay the $45 copay or try the telemed in a $10 copay. So I did the telemed. Um, I thought that went very well. Talked to the doctor. He asked a few questions. He goes, yep, sounds like you got an outer ear infection. I said, that's what I think. He goes, okay, where's your pharmacy? I'll call in antibiotic eardrops and <coughs> boom, done. So looking at the, the divertible things, by far the greatest dollar figure um, is the office visit for medical care. So now, it, say we adopt a clinic, and I have the same thing. So my option is I can do the telemed for 10 bucks, or I can go to our, our clinic for no copay. So, but 10 bucks, you know, gas three, north of three bucks a gallon. Um, with the telemed, I can stay home. Um, it might just be easier to call it in and and not have to go somewhere and maybe wait a little bit or, or whatnot. So I think this is the question I have for uh, the gal on the phone, because I think you said she works on, you know, people that would do this or not. In my mind, it's almost not worth, you know, I'd rather pay the 10 bucks and stay home for a minor thing like that. So when you look at the office visit medical care, can we break that down? Like how much is just a, you know, hey, I, I've got an earache or a sore throat or something that an antibiotic that the telemed guy can do? Or is it something, yeah, I cut my finger, I'm pretty sure I need stitches, so I have to go somewhere. Is there a way to break that down to see how many of those medical care visits would be divertible? As opposed to um, not using the telemed or something. Telemed versus yeah. going in. I'm sure that they can because it's procedure codes. So they can probably drill down based on the different procedure codes and the level of the visit, the severity of the visit in the ER setting. They ought to be able to do that. Um, okay. I don't know that we could do it right here right now. No, no, I understand that. Yeah, I'm kind of the same boat Commissioner Adams is. I don't, I think it's worth getting a, a proposal or two and, and looking at that and then making a final decision. Um, I can tell you from my point of view, it probably will depend a lot on what that proposal is, mm -hmm. whether I go with it or not, because you know, a cost of six to seven hundred thousand annual cost, and projected savings of two hundred and three thousand. We're losing money, right there at that level of, of diversion. So, um, I'd want to see ways we can increase that level of divergence to get closer to more of a break-even number. Because looking at some of the other things, the chronic condition management, preventive care. Those are relatively low dollars on this graph y'all provided, and it's that, that office visit for medical care that's the big gorilla mm -hmm. driving most of the, the um, uh, savings. So I'd really like to see how we can make sure that those cases really go to the clinic um, to try to drive up that, that divergent rate. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is the real opportunity is with the chronic conditions. That's the real opportunity that you have for increasing uh, your savings over time uh, is in helping people manage and prevent it from becoming that higher cost claim over someone's lifetime and keeping it just very manageable, keeping the employee healthy and, and keeping it from becoming uh, that that high dollar claim that that we would hope to avoid not not just for the plan's sake but for the member's sake uh, you don't want anyone to have to go through that so and it was interesting um, the the whole part of the telemedicine visit it, there's there's great value for that and it's great convenience but one of the things that happens when somebody actually goes into the clinic setting is they have to have a few things done the blood pressure right the big one 
and there have been cases where people have gone into a clinic setting and it's like your blood pressure is very high and there has been an intervention that has taken place as a result of that encounter, that in-person encounter that wouldn't have taken place or maybe that physician who had established relationship, you know, it, you know, hmm, what is this over here? You know, I noticed something and, and maybe it's a melanoma. I mean, you just don't mm -hmm. know. So there are some things that happen from an in-person visit that while telemedicine is, is very great and very convenient, m those opportunities, I don't believe could be caught in the same manner as an in-person visit. Although I am glad we added that telemedicine benefit because it does help. So yeah. on the chronic condition management, um, I don't think it's any secret that I had a heart attack back in 2012. So I, I have cholesterol medication and blood pressure and obviously a stent. So would that be considered a chronic condition? Potentially, yes. So yes, I would think instead so. of going to my cardiologist, would you be saying I'd, I'd go to the clinic person instead? No, um, basically the clinic would be helping with uh, keeping you on track. In other words, maybe you go there for the annual wellness, you know, just a wellness from, a, from the health clinic, and they just make sure that you're compliant with everything that your cardiologist has told you, and just a, another layer of support to help encourage that uh, compliance with the, the, the treatment plan that's been established for you. Whereas for some folks, they get a treatment plan established and then compliance goes off to the, you know, they mm -hmm. fall off and, and, no, but, and they never go anywhere until they have something that happens that requires they go somewhere and the lights are going and they're being transported somewhere. So what you hope to do is to get it before it becomes that very serious thing. So, um, so right now I see my cardiolo cardiologist about three times a year. Um, and just me personally, I don't feel like I need to go see anyone else because he's checking me three times a year. He does an EKG every year. Every couple of years I do a nuclear stress test, things like that. So I don't know if I would go to the clinic for an annual exam. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying me personally, unless it was something, unless there's a benefit to do that. So, you know, it might be something we have to look at hey, you do an annual exam, the county, you get a 50 bucks or another vacation day or, you know, some kind of incentive for somebody like me, because I'm, I'm going regular, I'm, I get checked and I feel like I'm monitored very closely um, to, to go to that clinic just for an annual exam. Right, and because you're already taking care of that for yourself. Right. Um, you probably wouldn't be in the number of the opportunity okay. <laughs> that we have. The opportunity is the, the individual who may have something and they have no idea they have it. Right. And, and they really aren't going and getting their numbers checked. And, and then it becomes that silent thing that we've heard about that can happen over time that can end up changing somebody's, somebody's um, future outcome. Right, okay. All right, thank Mr. you. Chairman, if I could be your doctor for a moment. Sure. I, I, I would think this would, uh, is what I would think would happen in the wellness clinic is you came in there because maybe you're having an upper respiratory thing that day. You know, it was just saying, so something, get in something quick, something thing. And that he would just ask you based on your history that he knows about, hey, are you following up all your cardiac stuff? You know, well, well I got an appointment next week with my cardiologist. All right, good. You know, just to make sure that, like she said, another a layer of support there, but mm -hmm. you're there primarily for your, because your, your head's been full for three days, your sinuses are killing you, you know, that, 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 that type of thing. That, that's, that's kind of where I see this going. And plus it also is an encouragement, you know, there wouldn't, you wouldn't have to pay the, the $60 deductible that you're paying your, 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 your uh, primary care, not necessarily cardiologist cardiologist should go to the fact that you can get in faster. You don't have to wait. You know, I can't see anybody till next week because I'm booked. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, you know, that, that, that's where I see all these benefits. And I do see the benefits on the long-term care uh, thing for somebody maybe that's a diabetic. Hey, are you following your diabetic protocols and medicines and you're taking your shots and all this sort of stuff? Even though you still would go see your endocrinologist on a, hopefully, at least a biannual basis. Mm -hmm. Th that's where I see this going. And some people may say it may not be worth the money. 
And, and again, I want to see what the what the what the RFP would be. I think that, that, that that'll be a big thing. But uh, this is not a way for us to to make money. I'm sure the first year wouldn't wouldn't be probably as great as we would want it to be. But I think once your employees and I, and this is employees and their family, you know, and their spouses. I mean, this would be great for like uh, my son, who's about three and a half year old. You know. Uh, has having a bad cold or something and they can't get in to see their doctor this is where you know this is where they would go to, to get her treated i think this would be a great thing and that's that's what we've got to focus on is for the employees of the county can it eventually hopefully pay for itself or get pretty close is it an incentive for some people that work here that 60 dollars deductible is a very important thing that they don't have to pay when they come here and i i think i think it's definitely worth pursuing to see if it's see if it's something that, that financially we can put together I think in the I think we need to look at our, our return on our investment in the in the long term on this I, I think that we'd be kidding ourselves to say well you know uh, one year it's not working let's go maybe if nobody shows up okay. so staff is uh, asking whether to go out for an RFP so commissioners what's your pleasure here mr. chair I'd be happy to make a motion that we go out and pursue um, an RFP and bring that back. Okay. Second. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Flesher. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm opposed. That motion passes four to one with Commissioner Moss opposed. Thank you. And thank you for coming, Jacqueline. Um, commissioners, uh, we can either take a quick break here or we have just a Couple more items and we can soldier on. What's the pleasure of the board? Soldier on. Soldier, soldier on. Hop, hop on <laughs> down. Hop on down. Okay. All right. <laughs> we will move on to the county attorney item, the um, Florida Development <laughs> Finance Corp consent resolution. Mr. Reingold. Thank you very much and good afternoon. The Florida Department uh, Development Finance Corporation uh, issues tax exempt bonds to finance projects with an economic development benefit in the state of Florida. In 2013, the county entered into an ILA which authorized the FDFC to operate within Indian River County, but that the board had retained through that resolution the ability to consent to any particular projects that the FDFC would benefit or would finance in Indian River County. So we've received a proposal. Uh, no Petro Echo District is seeking assistance from the FDFC for a production plant to capture, clean, and convert landfill gas into a pipeline grade transportation fuel. You've heard about this item uh, previously through some of our SWID discussions. Uh, thus, FDFC and No Petro are seeking approval from the, uh, of a resolution from this board authorizing the issuance of $20 million in bonds that would then go to pay for the project. Uh, please understand this will not be any debt tied to the Board of County Commissioners or Indian River County. Uh, this will be issued through the FDFC and there'll be separate bondholders uh, not accountable to us. So the county attorney's office recommends that the board approve the resolution which allows for FDFC to issue these bonds and with that I turn it back over to the chair. Thank you Dylan. Commissioners any questions of Dylan? If there is no questions um, I'm happy to see this project getting off the ground and, and moving forward so I would be happy to move approval. Make a second. We have motion by Commissioner Adams, second by Commissioner Flesher. Any discussion under the motion? No. Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5 0. Thank you for your support. Um, we already took care of my commission madam, so matter, so that takes us to uh, 14 E1. Commissioner Moss, your request to use the county commission chambers. Yes, um, thank you. And this is just to formalize the request that we previously discussed, which is to have approximately or welcome and invite invite and welcome 20 approximately 25 school children to our chambers uh, to uh, discuss local government and that will be for educational purposes. The time and day are already available. There's no uh, funding associated with this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> your member mentioned the Boys and Girls Club, so are they, are they going to pay the, the rate we charge for nonprofits to use public buildings? If they use this building, you mean? We, we have a policy that any public building 
um, we have a rate for commercial enterprises, and then we have a nonprofit rate to use any of the county public buildings. So my question is, is the, is the Boys and Girls Club, are they aware of that, and are they going to pay <clears throat> the rental fee? Because, like, if they rent a room at the IG Center or the fairgrounds, there, there's a, a rate structure for the use of the public buildings. No, I'm just, <clears throat> frankly, I'm surprised that you would bring it up. I mean, I would think or I would hope that we would want to encourage young people to come here. We know we have an attendance problem, but, you know, the, uh, with regard to meetings, that adults don't attend meetings uh, the way we might hope. Um, so I would expect that we want, would want to encourage young people to understand local government better, to feel welcome here, um, you know, without charge. You know, frankly, this building belongs to them. This building doesn't belong to us. The building belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to us. Uh, you know, we, we sit here, we're the stewards, we're the caretakers, or however you might want to view it, but we, we don't own this building. They own it. And I, I wouldn't charge them, I wouldn't charge school children to walk in here for an hour uh, to talk about local government. I think, uh, I, frankly, I'm... Well, Chris, I'm, I'm reason, sadly surprised. Well, the reason we I have, have the policy admit. is so that we don't get inundated by a flood of nonprofits wanting to come in here and use the chambers. If we got I a, realize it's for the children. If we got a flood but it, of school children, I'd be very happy. Well, it, it not could, talking about nonprofits. You remember we go back to the CARES Act. We had, what, 900 nonprofits listed here, you know? So if we don't charge a fee to one nonprofit, how can we charge a fee to another nonprofit if they want to use the building? That, fun that funding didn't even get used. The nonprofits, the, that funding did not even get used. Okay, but I'm, majority I'm saying we had over 900 nonprofits in this county, and I don't want all 900 to be coming, hey, we want to come use the county chambers for free. And that's why we have had this policy for a long time. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, you know, I think the county administrator had talked to you about our policies and the fact you went and reserve this for this event without really going through our process is a little disturbing as well. I mean, we have procedures, we have policies, and, you know, we, we should all follow them and not go off rogue and do something that is against our policies. Well, I didn't think of it as rogue to invite the community to their own building. Well, Just, we get a lot of the charter school it's, kids here. They're it's school, you're talking about school children, 25 school children for an hour. No, well, I'm no. talking about a principle in following policies and procedures is what I'm talking about. We're talking about the Boys and Girls Club. We're not talking about just children off the street coming in to um, our chambers. We're uh, talking about an organized event. Uh, we're not doing it. We're not asking anything more than what is asked of other nonprofits, and many of them are youth nonprofits. If the GYAC wanted to use it would be applied to them the same way. And I would suspect, because I know the city of Felsmere and the city of Sebastian have different rates for uh, businesses or commercial versus nonprofit groups that want to use their community buildings, that the city of Vero Beach does as well, and you guys probably applied those as well. Um, and I think what the chair is trying to figure out is what are we being asked to do? Are we being asked to waive the rules for this particular group? Are we being asked, because the way your, um, your agenda item is structured is we're being, you're requesting us to approve something, but you've left out the part where we would, in approving that, have to also waive the rules. So are you, being, are you asking us to do both? Because it, based on your comments, it seems like you have not spoken to the Boys and Girls Club about the fact that they would need to pay for the use of the facility. No, and frankly, um, I've already done this a number of times at Vero Beach City Hall, and there's, there's no charge there. Um, the people are always welcome. I've spoken to large groups of homeschool students. Uh, Boys and Girls Club was there. Um, they, they don't charge uh, for use of City Hall. So I'm sorry I'm a bit surprised and, and saddened uh, by this attitude or if you want to call it policy, I think it's a policy that should be revisited at some point. I mean, all everyone sitting here knows full well there's no audience. We can't even we cannot bring adults in here. How do you propose to ever change that if you don't welcome young people here? If you don't instill in them while they are students 
that they are welcome here and encourage their interest in local government. And if there's a policy against that, I really seriously hope that the four of you will consider revisiting it. I have nothing further to say about this. I can see where this is going, and I'm frankly very disappointed. Commissioner Ross, can I ask you, what, 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 was the, what, is, what are they going to do? Or like well, the, class? Is somebody having a class? Discuss, uh, discuss local government. That's, that's all it is. I've done this many times at Vero Beach City Hall. I've spoken to groups of up to 100 students about, and to encourage them to participate in local government. You look at, they're looking at all the empty seats. Are you going to be here to be the Yes, I would be here. I'm not the instructor, but yes, I, to, I mean, I obviously I've been in local government for five years. I have some credentials. Usually what I would do is I would also invite the county administrator, should he wish, and the county attorney, should he wish, uh, to be part of it. It's only an hour, so you know each of them might want to speak for a few few minutes. I hadn't invited them yet because we didn't have formal approval, but that was my plan. It gives it gives the the school children um, not only encouragement to participate, but also part of it is to think about government as a career opportunity. You know, perhaps someday they'll want to run for office. Perhaps someday they'd want to be a county attorney or a county administrator, and hearing about, well, you could be very inspiring. Don't, you know, you could be. So, it gives you the opportunity, it gives us, it gives, it, you know, it, it gives you the opportunity to inspire. Right. So let me ask you a question. And welcome I've them. been, I, when I was with the city of Felsmere as the mayor, I was asked by the elementary school on a yearly basis to come to the elementary school and talk to the fourth and fifth graders about civics, government, being the mayor and what that entails. I know Joel Tyson, as the mayor now, has always been asked by the Sebastian High School to come and talk to them. So is this your event or is this the Boys and Girls Club event? And let me clarify, did, did you ask them to come here or did they call you to speak to them? They, they, asked, they asked if they could come here. They asked me. Okay, so typically, in uh, yes, I go out to the schools too. Typically, in that type of situation, it would be the chair of the organization or the mayor or that that ceremonial figurehead who would be representing the group and, and giving that discussion. And so I'm a, I'm just a little confused as to how you've ended up being that person. But beyond that, I don't think there's anything that would prevent you from going to the Boys and Girls Club and speaking to them there as an alternative. Not that, not that I know of. And if, if that's the wish of the board, that's fine. But all I'm suggesting is that you might want to revisit the policy. You, you see, there's nobody here. There is literally nobody in the audience. It's not about you start when you start. Boys and girls. You start by welcoming people. That's how you get people in these seats. You start by having a welcoming stance, a welcoming attitude. You welcome students. You welcome young people. You welcome adults. You welcome the community. And I can see that that's not the case. Well, again, thank you. I'll say one more time. It's about following our policies and procedures. The Boys and Girls Club is more than welcome to come here if you want to give them a, a lesson in government. But like any nonprofit, we have a fee schedule for use of county buildings. So that's Anyone all we're doing watching this is video following our policy. We just got a lesson in government and not a good one. I'm so sorry. All right. So if you're done with discussion, we will go ahead and move on to the Solid Waste Disposal District. Approval of the minutes of October 19, 2021. We'll approve, Ms. Chair. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams. All in favor, signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Item 15B2, work order number 14 to Geosyntec for annual permit, compliance monitoring, and reporting for 2022. Move approval. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner Adams. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. And the final item is amendment number one to work order number 44 to Kimley Horn for the landfill gas flare skid improvements and pipeline extension. Motion approved. 
We have a motion by Vice Chair Ehrman, second by Commissioner Flesher. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. And I believe that concludes the agenda. Um, I know that several of us are traveling to Tallahassee for the um, legislative day with Florida Association of Counties. So I wish everybody safe travels and a safe trip home. And if there's no further business, or Commissioner Adams. I will be staying here to hold down the fort for you guys. And I just want to wish you a frogtastic trip and a happy <laughs> and hoppy, safe time up there in Tallahassee. And Thank I just you. couldn't miss getting all my puns in, sorry. And, and, and what, what, what are the dates and times of that frog leg thing again? Uh, Thursday, um, January 20th through Sunday, January 23rd. Hop on out to Felsmere. If you make it to Felsmere, you can't miss it because it takes over the whole town. Awesome. And with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>